We're glad. What's up, everybody? Let me get rid of this thing here. You want it up? Yeah. Okay. Welcome, everybody. I'd like to invite you all to breaking down lake maps based on seasonal patterns. I'm Josh Douglas, and this is my good buddy, Bassmaster Elite Series Pro Seth Fighter. What's up? I'm getting rid of this because I can't see anything. What's it? Oh. Okay. <clears throat> All right, everybody. Again, we like to thank everybody for coming on. Um, people are still kind of rolling in, but I'm going to go through the uh, through some of the stuff um, to get things rocking and rolling. As you can see here on the screenshot we got, we got a chat option and a question and answer question or portion. We definitely like questions. We do questions Even heavy. Common. We'll sit here with you. You ask, we'll answer. We will. That, that gives us ideas for next one and definitely keeps the, the deal going. Um, but please, when you ask questions, please use the question and a question and answer portion. When you ask a question, only Seth and I can see that. That's not something that put out to everybody. Uh, we also, we get a lot of chat action going on and a lot of people chatting. We appreciate that. Um, a lot of uh, the viewers all getting going back and forth and we, we tend to kind of look at that a little bit But we're not able to really keep up with it. So just make sure the questions that you want us to specifically answer are uh, Coming through the Q&A portion real quick. I'll get into how you do that for computer users again This is coming off a of Mac. But you can see right here is the Q&A um, Right here, you're gonna do this if you're using a smartphone Use the Q&A function right here. You can see that and here's how you're going to do it on an iPad. Just ask the question, type it in, we'll get it, and we're going to get to all these at the end of our webinar when we get through our presentation part. First things first. Yeah. Congratulations is in order. Scott, you want it to Tula. Scott Robinson. CT, brand new. You're the man. That was from our really, Bassmaster really sweet Classic real. one. That was awesome. Uh, I believe he's already got it. Scott, I believe he's already got that and, and sent us a big thanks. And, we appreciate you guys tuning in. We try to bring top prizes for everybody who comes on live. We appreciate it. Uh, attendance giveaways. <clears throat> we want to thank these these awesome sponsors. These are sponsors of ours um, in some capacity or not. And they obviously sponsored this webinar. Uh, BioVex, this is your exact tackle package. We got three of them we're giving away. A BioVex tackle package with that joint bait everybody wants. And the Colt tail, I've been doing a lot of work. Seth and I are both with Ocast Tackle, use their jigs all across the country. Yep. And Rapple, you got a nice assortment pack for Yeah. Me. Yeah, got a little bit of everything in there. The Terminator Frog, you've been busting them on that, That's now. the deal. You're getting ready to get going right. on it, right? Yeah. All right, and our featured giveaway for this is the uh, TH from TH Marine. It's the Hydra Wave uh, H2. Seth and I have both been big users of the Hydra Wave for, for a long time now. and um, Big fans of this, and we're excited to be able to give it away for one lucky viewer. Remember, yeah. for these prizes, you just got to be on live. That's it. You know, obviously, we put these up for the educational purposes for everyone to be able to view at a later date. Um, but at the same time, for these prizes, this is this is awesome for people that are viewing on coming on live. And basically, we just pick people in attendance at random and and send them off. So we got some awesome prize packages. We'll continue to grow this thing as we get going. Mapping. We asked you all what you all wanted to hear for this. We get a lot of input. We appreciate all the input that we get. Uh, emails, text, direct message, you name it. We get it. And uh, this is the number one asked for topic was mapping. Yep. Y'all voted. That's what you're getting. And I, it's, it doesn't really come as a surprise to me much. Um, what's funny is we, we, we pay so much attention to our units themselves, no matter what you're running. Uh, but really, our map card is what breathes life into that unit and gives us a starting point. That that's where the fisherman comes into play. You got to know, you got to feel where a bass is going to be for sure. What yeah, the, without without map cards, Navionics map cards in my units and stuff, I, I'd be literally lost on the lake. Wouldn't know what to do. Absolutely, and it's eliminating the guesswork. We've used this slide before. If you look at this screenshot or this this picture of my unit right above this, you can see I'm fishing an underwater uh, underwater map underwater point on my map and if you look ahead of me on this on this uh, shoreline there's really not a point there so for anyone to know that there's a point there you'd have to be guessing if I look at my Navionics map here on the bottom there is a point and right here is what it actually looks like then I turn to my electronics and, and find what's going on mapping options we've come a long way yeah 
Still a big fan of a, of a paper map. There's just something about getting your paper map for the derby or getting you, ready to go fish. You can see the big picture a lot better on a paper map. Um, I, I recommend getting a paper map for every place you go to and use it in uh, use it along with your mapping cards. Um, it's just uh, it gives you a, a bigger picture. You can look at the whole lake and kind of get a better idea of what's going on versus when you're on your map card, you're typically looking at pretty small sections of the lake. And it's relatively, I mean, really, when I show up to a lake, I mean, we both run Navionics, but we're going to use whatever tools we can get our hands on at yeah. the end of the day when it comes to mapping. And and this is one of them. So, be, you know, be able to jot notes down or even even little things like, you know, places you've stayed, whatever. I've, be, I've used my a paper map, comes in handy. It goes with me again and again and again wherever I go. And you can get some old data sometimes that you can't even get on today's newer maps sometimes different data like yeah. what used to be their old cities stuff like that road beds and stuff a lot, yeah. a lot of that stuff's on your navionics card as well but and typically the paper map isn't a really solid uh structure map i mean it'll show you general stuff you know like there might be a large hump there but it's not going to show you the intricate points and turns of it but like i said it's good for big picture stuff you know sections of the lake and uh maybe transition or you know routes that fish use to get from shallow to deep let me ask you something. Be honest. On the hot map maps, maps, you can look on there and you see the little spots where they say there's large mouth and there's small mouth. Is that how you got on the Elite Series? Um, no, it's funny though. I, maps. <laughs> I went to the St. John's River and um, Destin had a guy I stayed with Destin to Marion. He, he had uh, paper maps of the whole thing, and we actually I actually read the, everything on there and found it like. <laughs> Every place they said bass spawned on that lake, and kind of made sure I checked all of them. And <laughs> most of them held pretty true. Heck yeah. So, um, community holes are community holes for reasons because they're just usually fish there. So, let's talk about the nuts and bolts of our mapping. Uh, definitely the most, the most advanced forms of it. Um, Seth and I both use run the Navionics Plus card. This is a preloaded card. Uh, it has changed. Navionics Plus originally was introduced as as a just a two gig. You load whatever data you want on it. Most importantly, it came with nautical chart, sonar chart. We're going to get into a lot of that. But the Navionics Plus card, as of as of how it'll go in the future, here is it actually comes preloaded with nautical chart. So no matter what you get to the lake, you're going to have mapping. And, and this red grid pattern is showing you on my Lorance where I have coverage. I have coverage in the U.S., Canada and coastal waters. I mean, I have nautical charts for everywhere. So I always have a map that is plug and play, ready to rock and roll wherever I go. As opposed to Navionics and other competitor cards out there, you do regions also. Navionics is the first one to actually give you the entire continent of North America and all the data there to get you rocking and rolling and all for a $200 price point as opposed to the old way of regional mapping. I mean, how many cards did you have to keep Oh. And you're running three graphs. Tons. Fishing across the country. Yeah. I mean, even if you were just fishing in your state and never left your state and you're running two graphs, that's still two cards that you have to purchase um, just for that that region. Now you can download anywhere. I mean, yeah. going to Canada just for that one lake, you don't have to buy just a Canadian card. Yeah. You can just go there and, and you can just download that map. Yeah. It's the only way to go for anyone who's <laughs> traveling. Um, if you stay in one region, that's great. But also, um, with the Navionics Plus, you're getting the freshest data. I mean, a lot of the, a lot of those, you know, tucked away areas, smaller stuff that isn't that popular, hasn't been mapped that well. And um, now with the the sonar charts and stuff, they got up to date. You know, the freshest data you can get, and that's what you get with the Navionics Plus card. Uh, practice starts at home, wouldn't you say? For sure. Let's talk. I mean, we're going to get into some of the more of the technical stuff right away. Some of the some of the stuff that's there for us at our fingertips to be able to use to give us advantage on the water, help make your, your uh, practices more efficient by finding places that you can go before you even get to the lake based off seasonal patterns. Then we're going to actually get into what we're looking for, seasonal pattern type stuff. And the, the Navionics web app and mobile app are great ways, uh, that and your paper map at home, to sit there and go back and forth and try to figure out some good stuff. Uh, with the mobile versions or, or the, the mobile app, you can download anything, whether it's a region like you can see here, uh, single lakes like here, or even parts of lakes. I, if I'm going to be on the western part of Lake Erie, I don't need to download the entire Lake Erie. I'm just going to take that western basin from Sandusky to the Big Point, Canada, and over. Uh, you can kind of cut it up however you want. You customize the map for your 
what you want. Uh, transferring waypoints, we do this all the time. Seth and I can be fishing, fun fishing, just out doing whatever, and we find something that we like. Uh, you know, we're both good fishermen, both fishing, just having to be in one of the other's boat. You can download waypoints, save them, transfer them over to your unit. That's all real simple to do. Uh, adjusting water level offset. This is great. I understand that now Navionics has teamed with Ray Marine on that front right away and, and um, now has that water level offset available to, to Ray Marine users. But it's always been available by Navionics. Um, it just may not be yet to your, whether you're running a Humminbird or a Lowrance, um, the best thing to do to get this function would be to simply just send a letter in to whoever it is that you run and request that they add that in an update. But here you can see it. This is the same body of water. I actually tricked Seth on this one when he first got here earlier today. Um, this one right here shows the pool at minus 15. So it, it fluctuates and changes the way the lake is going to look when the pool from, from full pool is down 15 feet. Here you can see what 49 feet looks in extreme. Now that's extreme just to show you. Literally turn this entire reservoir into just a river. Um, what it originally probably was before it dropped down. But still, we do go to lakes like Douglas and stuff that fluctuate so yeah. heavily, so quick. And, and then there's droughts like Texas. Texas was in a severe drought. Oh, yeah. and, and this gives you, lets you look at a more realistic option because if we showed up and it was really 50 feet low, this map would do us absolutely no good. We'd be yeah. confused, to say the least, For sure. trying to find where we're going. For sure. Probably running ground a couple times. Probably running ground a little bit. <laughs> All right, nautical chart versus sonar chart. This has kind of been a big one. I get this during my electronics trainings. I get calls from anglers of, from Elite Series pros all the way to, to weekend warriors and everything in between. Um, what is sonar chart? How to activate it? Nautical chart and sonar chart. Nautical chart is Navionics' base layer of mapping. What we've gotten to know for forever it, it covers, it, they got like 18,000 plus strong in the United States alone. I don't know if there's a mapping, there isn't a mapping company out there that has more lake maps than Navionics is in their database. However, things can be fine-tuned. Things can be, <clears throat> things can be missed and, and, and uh, there could be problems that need to be fixed, all of which now is available to users through, through sonar charts. So basically nautical chart is, is any boaters, anybody, it shows you the navigation channel. If you click on your sonar charts, you get different mapping. You get fishing-related mapping, stuff that's off the beaten path, not in federal water. In this case, we're looking at Fort Gibson. Fort Gibson is, by Navionics, is perfect all the way, but for whatever reason, they never had the data of this one bay. And it's not for whatever reason, I should say creek arm. It's not for whatever reason. It's because it is literally full of stumps, uh, filled with stumps. And the charting crew, who that was, didn't want to go in there to wreck their deal, didn't go in there, maybe thought it was too shallow, whatever the deal was. This is, this is now what's available. It was contributed, made, and within an hour, and now everybody can view this kind of mapping. I mean, that's strong. If we go back and look at it, you know, yeah. there's been major tournaments won out of that arm right there alone. Never had mapping. Now they have mapping. Yep. You would want that when you go to Fort Gibson. For sure. Uh, here's another one, a uh, nautical chart ver and, and a sonar chart. If you're looking at the web app, here's how you're going to activate that. Navionics, this is just showing their nav the regular chart. Here's sonar chart. You can see just a little bit more detail. Everything's a little bit more fine-tuned, um, and that's how you would activate that on the web app or the mobile <laughs> app. I'm going to show you how to do this. I, I take countless calls from people on the rants want to know how to activate sonar charts. Uh, for the time being, it's a little bit confusing, and I'll explain why, but, but it's extremely easy to do nonetheless. Uh, how to activate sonar charts on a Lowrance. Uh, first thing you're going to do from the chart screen, you have to be on the chart screen. If you can see, this map is actually uh, uh, Sturgeon Bay, and it's showing you the original mapping that they have. Mind you that when they first get this data, chart crews go out there and do what we would call mowing the lawn. They're going to go back and forth like this, 100 yard swoops that'll call it hd everything else gets guesstimated it's called interpolation and they guesstimate everything in between they miss a lot of stuff in a football field that's a lot of data wow. to miss navionics is on our charts now well we're fishing we're logging data we're constantly just while we're going in between it's just taking a satellite signal with a sonar signal and filling in the data connecting the dots, everything that you get in between, and also updating it and staying on top of it. 
So to activate it, you're gonna go from your chart screen, click on chart options, click on view. You'll see the fish and ship button. It gets a little confusing here because this was, this was Lowrance and Hummingbirds and originally Navionics's wording for what Sonar Charts is. It's actually Sonar Chart. It'll be available sometime for Lowrance and Hummingbird on, on an update uh, when, when, whenever they get that worked out. But highlight the fish and ship and there you go. Go back and forth. Look at the difference between the mapping. It's com completely changed. Look at the trench that you can find right up here, how that trench is out and makes a hump. Hummingbird, wanna walk us through it? Yeah, really simple. Um, here's a little lake on Minnetonka, Lake PV. Uh, it's not on uh, this, the nautical map. It doesn't have any contours in the sonar charts it does. Um, there's a lot of small backwater stuff that's like this on the Navionics cards. Um, click menu twice. And then this page will come up, scroll over to chart, scroll down, hit a uh, chart select, and then switch it to left, or depends what side you got it in, chip. left or right, either one, it'll pop up. You want to select to the fish and chip card, and then boom, you got contours where you didn't have them before. So really super simple. Just a few clicks and uh, a How often are you using the mapping. sonar chart as opposed to the nautical chart when um, you're uh, Almost all day, always. every day. And the only reason you want is if they don't have yet sonar charts, but yeah. they literally take 2,000 in a day. That's how many contributions are coming in, whether that's charting crews, us fishing, boaters, anybody, but 2,000 a day. That updates. And water changes. I mean, rivers, that's, oh, that's a given. Rivers and stuff change big. Sandbars, all kinds of stuff man. like that. That's always Flooding always changes. Moving. can change a hump on Kentucky Lake. It ain't going to move it. But it'll warp it and change it. Change the sweet spot. Yeah, absolutely, sure. it will. All right. Raymarine. This is Raymarine. Raymarine is, is big with uh, uh, Navionics as well. Um, Navionics, as most people know, works in almost every chart plotter company out there. You want to run us through real quick on how to do this? Yeah. Um, pretty easy here, too. Select menu. Go to presentation. Select chart selection. This will pop up. Go to sonar chart instead of nautical chart. Hit OK. And Bam. boom. Now you got a map. Don't do. Really That's easy. how you activate a few, that. A few clicks and you're make sure much you're good not. To go. I mean, for our Minnesota, I mean, I'm talking, I lived down in Chickamauga before. A lot of maps have been redone down on the Tennessee River. Kentucky's been redone. And then up here for our Minnesota, I mean, you name it, it's had contributions to it, but some of them are so over the top good, it, it's getting silly. Like, like which is every advantage we can get every yeah, single turn for sure we can see on that map it is going to help us every change is going to help us make decisions yeah. when we're on the water let's get into some some stuff we got a few questions piling up yeah let's let's, let's let them let's run quick. through them and, and, and then, with those then we'll questions, get into the meat and potatoes of the deal all right with those questions too please remember we flew through some of this stuff anything specific that you want to know um please by all means send in the questions and we will get to them more. How do I do this? Ben. Breeze over here All teaching right. the stuff. Thanks, Kiggs. <laughs> All right, ready? Damn, bro. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, my Rottweiler decided to uh, light the room up real quick. When he knows we can't, we can't. None of us can go anywhere. Give a shout out. We got Dayton here. We got our boy Pete P. AKA Chug. Chug. He's always, he rolls. It's a tough Dude. one. Sorry, guys. Dog All right. All right. All right. Let's just start at the top and work down. Oh, there's nothing there. Did you see one? You just go up. We'll run through. He fixed it. Somebody says he can't hear nothing. He had it fixed it. All right. Right. Do you all scan for beds when you're looking for deeper largies and smallies in 6 to 10? How do you approach those fish, both catching, fishing the bed, and not scaring the fish? Okay. Um, the deep water ones, they're not near as spooky as the shallow water ones. You can actually see beds on your side scan. Absolutely no doubt can. about it. No doubt. Hard to say if there's a fish on it or not. There's def you can definitely see the depressions. may or may not have a fish on it. Um, and honestly... And if the water's dirty, you're just you're never gonna know. You can mark it and cast around. Um, I wouldn't worry about scaring the fish. There is a product called a flogger. I think is the 
official yeah. name. I think maybe Poor Boy sells You didn't make them. that name up? That's no, but I, I told some other guy about it. And he looked it up on the internet and came up with a bunch of weird yeah, you stuff. Don't, so. look, don't look for it in that Yeah, fashion. Go to Tackle Logger Warehouse. Logger also has another meaning that yeah. you don't want to know about. Um, but it, it, it's, tackle ba- warehouse in order it's basically a piece of glass attached to a tube that you set on the water. You can see, like, it's like looking through an aquarium if you get one, provided you have clear water. Um, that's a great way to see them, especially – and you'll find beds – a lot deeper than that. Fish, fish will spawn like, um, I mean, probably two, three, four times deeper than you can see, depending on the place you're at. I mean, if you can see the bottom in ten feet, there's for sure probably fish spawn in twenty feet that you'll you'll never see with your naked eye. And as a general rule, those are big ones too. Bigger ones, as a general sometimes, rule, sometimes, sometimes, like sometimes in bigger beds, especially sometimes. smallmouth. Sometimes. <laughs> That's good enough. <laughs> Some, as I said, as a general rule. Really. Yeah, I, I've seen it go the other way, too, though. Where they're the shallowest? I yeah. have seen that, too. I, I actually have. just saw that at Malay. A lot of people yeah. were I, I would say shallow, with smallmouths more so than ever. You know, you know, say you got a lake, you can see eight feet of water, and the majority of your fish are spawning, that you can see are spawning in six, seven feet. I've seen those be a lot of, like, three-pounders a lot of times. Oh. And then you get up way up on a flat in the middle of nowhere and there's one cinder block up there by and, himself. And there's a, Literally. there's a four and a half, five 200 pound yards, male up there. Spawning, then 200 yeah. yards, find another one. Yep, yep. For sure. But yeah, like I said, I wouldn't worry about spooking those deeper ones. A flogger is a great way to see them. Um, you can mark, uh, you know, with your side scan, you can run a waypoint out if you do see a bed on there and then just blind fish, you know, make 10, 20 casts. Those fish should bite fairly easy. Uh, being deeper because they're not as spooky. I mean, the first good cast you get in the bed, the fish should bite. Um, but that's what I do. And as a general rule of thumb from a guy that stares at electronics a whole bunch and and, and interpretation of them, it's going to be a whole heck of a lot easier to see largemouth beds than it is going to be smallmouth beds because smallmouth are so much always around rock to some extent. And that rock, once you get around rock, just blends in so much stuff in between there but a nice sand spot of a large mouth you'll, you'll probably see more often than not aaron so i was on tonka last friday it kicked his butt seemed like carp responded in every bay i went to and a huge algae bloom everywhere couldn't find clear water without algae bloom until i got into uh so same saw water from 56 south to Big Island and mid sixties and sugs. Is there just major transition going on or did I completely miss the boat? Should I have kept on moving around to find more warmer water or just focused on one bay and fished every inch of it? Uh, sometimes that's, I mean, a good, sometimes it's good just to get in one bay and make it a lot more manageable for you to figure out what the fish are doing. As soon as you, you do that. Um, Aaron, I was actually out on the lake that same day with you too. It's, it's, uh, I, I did that. I, I launched in one bay and, and I just kind of looked around until I, I figured out that the fish were shallow and on beds. And then I kind of just stuck with that the entire rest of the day. I mean, instead of looking for transient fish, I'd rather find fish that are right there. And, um, but, but yeah, any input on, uh, I mean, there's fish in every inch of Tonka and warm water is important. I mean, he did say I mean, finding the warmer water is going to be the best. Yeah. Well, it depends what, I mean, it's going to fish different depending on what bay you're in. Um, some bays will be warmer, you know, you go in the shallower, dirtier bays, it'll be a little warmer than like the main clear lake. But I mean, there's obviously fish in every inch of that lake. Um, and honestly, anytime I fish a tournament, we've pretty much made two laps around the lake. So I don't know if staying in one bay and fishing, it might be the best option. I'd, I'd, I'd run, I mean, there's always fish biting somewhere. So I like to run all around a lot when I get on that lake. But, and, uh, and on that lake, they're in all stages of the spawn yeah. right oh, yeah. now. Everything's going on right now. There's pre-spawn fish, there's spawning fish, there's post-spawn fish. Um, you know, I would just focus on whatever you're most confident in, you know, and, and it, try to make that happen because you can make any sure. bite happen on that lake, you know. If you want to throw a frog, you can. If you want to crank in 20 feet of water, you can. I mean, yeah, and if you want to become a better bed fisherman, then you go out there no matter what, the, as long as they're up shallow on bed, yeah. and you force it, whether there's only a few or – you get up there and you, you learn how to yeah. do it. And in that case, you know, I mean. And don't let them carp scare you. There's bass, no. there's bass right and around they were, the carp. They were too. right around them carp. They, you, you they're might, all pushing the bank for a reason. The crappie are there. The yeah. bluegills are there. Everything's in like two foot. Yeah. If there's carp there, there's bass there. They like the same things. 
Um, there might be yeah. something about that. Or did it do one of those deals? Let's get to the, let's go, but we got to do the deal and we can get to all the questions. Okay. Well, you want to do it now? You want to take that one? Well, there's a bunch on there. All right, take them. Okay. Have you used the all new Steez TW and how awesome is it? Uh, I actually only played with it at the Bassmaster Classic. I never got to make a cast with it, but it feels pretty Makes nice. Deal. Yeah. I mean, the, the zillion, uh, the zillion SV as a SV spool and a T wing, and it's it's an awesome reel. I can only imagine Steez is even better. Um, all Pete right. says it's the deal. He chimed in. I threw it. It's good. I know when um, I was at Capra's the other day, there was a lot of How do you sport. target? Reed asks, how do you target spawning areas by looking at the map? That's something we're going to go into. Uh, audio quality is coming in and out. Can't help you with that. Sorry, guys. Yeah. If, it is, uh, if it's us on our part, I'm not sure if it is. We keep getting more participants coming on, and we're not getting too much. Please let us know if, if we are. Not much we can do, but we are getting some pretty good thunderstorms right now here in Minnesota. So. It could be us. Uh, hope it's not. Nick asks, what's the worst place you've ever come across in regards to map switches? I'd say mostly rivers. Um, just because they're like, change. there's so many, uh, like a lot of them areas, depending on what time of year the mapping crew gets there, a lot of them backwaters they can't even get into, um, you know, at certain times of the year. So there's big backwaters that they can't even see. So definitely uh, shallow river systems are the worst for uh, – mapping but uh, you, you can't blame them like i said if, if they go there in august and stuff you're going to be fishing in march and april when the water's high is literally dry land so pretty hard for them to map that um steven asks malax summer pattern how would you approach this lake at this time of the year end of july time frame uh pretty much wide open that time of year you can catch them shallow you can catch them deep kind of just dictate on the conditions of the day is what i'd focus on more than anything uh roger asks first time watching how often do you do a video and can you watch all other older videos yeah we got them all up on youtube uh we try to do once a month but we've been so busy traveling around the summertime the last in couple the, months in the off season uh, we definitely come at it once a month we've slowed they're down. fun for us give us something to do but this time yeah. of year trying to get our schedules aligned and still bring quality content uh that's a big one for us so we tend to do every other month yeah Nick asks, what's the best coloration on your unit for side imaging, best detail? Uh, I play around with that quite a bit between uh, both the amber colors and the blue color are probably my three favorite. kind of depends on the lake you're on and what's going on. Um, and, you know, if you go to a place that's got a ton of, a ton of hard bottom, that, that amber is kind of almost overpowering. Everything looks good. That's when I switch to more like the blue than the, you know, uh, stuff pops out a little better and uh, in places that don't have a lot of hard bottom I, I like that amber because it jumps out at you so good I'm with him on that especially with Lawrence I'm number six on Lawrence which is uh, that amber type color that he's it's what we've all been accustomed to otherwise blue is really good too blue I, I go back and forth a little bit um, pretty true to six but outside of that I don't don't vary too much if you don't have all the confidence in the world in your side imaging because you want to just stick with the basics and get to know it. Once you start getting outside of that, um, you're changing your look on you every time. Yeah. Aaron asks, when are we getting to the map breakdown? Yeah, we're getting to real it. quick. Uh, anonymous asks, post spawn large mouse. We'll Where do that. they go? What's the best way to go about finding them? We're going to get to right, that. Let's do it. We'll come back to these questions. Let, let them stimulate up some more. All right. It's not our connection. Good. All right. I have to figure out how to do Good this again now. Whoops. Uh, new share. No. Yep. New share. Google Chrome. All right, guys. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to move this down for now. Okay. We are at Navionics.com. We're going to kind of try to do this live because the point of this whole thing is how are we thinking on our feet? It's time to go fishing. No matter what season it is, we need to figure out where the bass are. We need to, when you launch your boat, where are you going? You got to know where you're going. Yeah. So we're going to utilize Navionics' web app. Uh, it's free for everybody how to do it. Uh, it basically look, works as a, like kind of like a Google Earth format where you can zoom in like this, and you can zoom out. It literally has all of Navionics' data, both nautical chart and sonar chart. Uh, nautical chart is here. We're going to flip this thing to sonar charts. 
and let's get this thing going. Here's how we're going to break it down. We're going to break it down by where's my pad of paper. Thank you. We're going to break it down by seasons. Yeah. The first one is going to be uh, winter. Winter and, and pre-spawn. Pre let's uh, let's pull up a reservoir around here. Ooh, pressure on let me touch this. All right. You got it. No, I don't think I do. It's Minneapolis, bro. Here, zoom up. Where are you going to? I'll just get on a reservoir. Uh, not much to talk about for winter with uh, natural lakes. We're they, up here in Minnesota, but we do they, have a national audience. They we tend to be covered in everything. ice. All right, here's Table Rock. And we don't know nothing about ice fishing. No, we don't do it. Zoom, zoom, zoom. Yeah, we're zooming. Oops. You're going to have to run this, man. What are you looking for? I'm messing up. What are you looking for? Just zooming on the light. Okay. Sorry, he doesn't know how to work my Mac. My bad. Uh, winter Winter's going to be a lot like summer. Um, main, main river slash main lake is where I'm going to spend most of my time. Um, right off the bat, uh, we got out, outside channel swings are awesome spots in the winter. Um, pre-spawn, like early, early pre-spawn, winter, uh, summer, late fall. Um, you see this uh, outside river bend? You can look right there. That, you can tell just by looking on your map, you got a bluff wall right there on that little point. That's going to be an awesome spot to look. I love fishing bluffs. Uh, they just, they always have fish on them. doesn't matter the time of year. Good places to look. Some are better than others. Um, and then uh, the other thing is real flat points like this. Clay points, too. Yeah, these points where they got – this is a really good one, too. You got yep. river channel on both sides, an ice creek channel coming in here. This would be an awesome spot to look in the winter, this big flat point. I drive around on this, look for some fish, maybe even this one, too. And uh, if you're dealing with spots, they really like these guts. You see this – You see this. Uh, I wouldn't call it a creek channel, but it's a gut that runs right into this pocket. That's the place I'd focus at for spots, um, as long as bluff walls and uh, these big flat points. Um, just really stay close. You don't want to go run way up a creek and fish in the back of there. I mean, there will still be some lar a few large mouths in there, that, depending on where you are in the country. But typically, most of your fish are going to be relating to the main river channel, some form, in that, in that winter slash early pre-spawn. Early pre-spawn. Yeah, this is like your A-rig, jerk bait time, uh, maybe a football jig. but. Um, bridges will be solid. Bridges, you know, so, yeah. I mean, anywhere I mean, where shad is going to congregate. Yeah, all, all the numbers. shad's going to be in the main channel or those uh, creek channels running up the stuff. You know, the deeper water. They might be, you know, ten feet down over forty, fifty feet, but everything's going to be relating to that channel. Um, and th that's just going to be a reoccurring theme going through this. Those fish use those guts and those ditches and creek channels and river channels. They use them to migrate. Those are highways. Uh, that's something, especially on these re reservoirs. You don't really have those on natural lakes, but um, all these reservoirs, these are going to be stuff uh, the fish use to travel. So anytime during transitions, um, they're definitely great places to look. And talking about the actual pre-spawn of things too, and we'll get up into into some natural lake stuff. But you did mention running up rivers and stuff when when yeah. they. Pre-spawn might be a good time to find run up the river. That water warms up a little quicker. Yeah. It tends to be a little more muddy. That's another thing you want to pay attention to on uh, reservoirs. Most of them have uh, what I would consider two to three sections of reservoir. Um, you're definitely going to have your, your down river section. That's going to be where the dam is. Clear water. It's going to be general. typically clear, colder. Deeper. Deeper. Um, these will be the last places fish spawn. Um, you know, this place is going to be – this section of the lake it will be a couple of weeks to a month behind the upper river, which would be the other section. I know a lot of guys will break it down to two to three sections and include mid-lake. And the mid-lake will kind of just fall in between the upper river patterns and the bottom end patterns. But some of these places we go, I feel like there's really only two sections yeah, to the high. lake. I'm the same. Um, I mean, you can see here – like, if you run way up these – my bad, but it's my computer. 
if you run way up, this is what I'm calling upper river. It's going to go a lot shallower. Look at the main channel. That's only going to be 20, 30 feet. You're not going to have that 70 to 80 feet deep like you will on the main river channel. It's typically going to be dirtier water. It's going to warm up quicker, shallower. Um, this is what, typically on most of your reservoirs where your better largemouth fishing is to be had. Um, they're all a little different, but typically the upper river section um, is better largemouth fishing, a lot more shallow water cover. Well, yeah, so yep, just, stuff yeah, like a that. But, uh, a, lot, a lot of river fishing. You know, yeah. and a lot of these largemouths, they might not go all the way out to the, the main river to winter, whatever. They're gonna, especially some of these creeks have got some deep water in them. These little outside bends and stuff like that, where you get that deep water up around the bank, stuff like that. That's gonna be the places you look for them in the winter. Places with quick deep water access where, you know, they can pull up on something, you know, 10, 20 feet down, feed, and then slide out into 30, 40 feet and get away from the 30 degree air that's above them or what, whatever you may have. But, uh, Tend, the, the shorelines tend to be less manicured too. A lot of times you run up them rivers, you do get yeah. There's gonna be a lot of lay down, like shallow bushes. covers, and, stuff, and less deeper docks, less yeah. You know, you not taking care of banks, stuff like that, and, and uh, a little bit just more river fishing because that's essentially yeah. what they are. Is river. It, it's shallower, dirtier waters. Your fish are gonna stay shallower at the upper end of your reservoirs, typically. Let's talk about a little pre-spawn, pre-spawn northern stuff. Um, okay. Want to talk smally or largey? Well, uh, quick. Sure. I can. Where you want to go? Go up to Miramar. Okay, this is Malax. Um, this is Miramar. I'm not a good one. Oh, yeah, just one click. Double click. Yeah, but you don't. I double clicked it too. All right. Okay. <laughs> All right. Here, here's a. This is Miramar Reef. I'm sure everybody's fish my axis fish this. Um, a lot of fish live on this place, um, and they're, you know, they're gonna spawn and do a lot of their spring summer stuff up here on this flat. Um, Pre-spawn when the fish are coming out of the winter holes. I'm really gonna focus right here. Right there. I mean, that, that jumps out the most at me on my map. We got a nice Vertical. steep break. Those fish can stay off that edge, but they're still close to where they want to be. Um, and a lot of times the females will hang out there while the males are yep. up pestering and doing stuff. This is looks like an awesome pre-spawn spot for me for small mouse. You guys can uh, see that, right? Sharp okay. breaks and stuff. That's really what they're going to relate to, but close to where they're going to go. Okay. Um, like I said, they're going to get up on this flat. They're going to spawn. They're going to spend some time here after they spawn. But right here is definitely the first place I would look at on this. And, uh, you know, same deal on this little, we got a little hump here, same deal. Some fish are going to come up here and spawn, hang out on this flat right here. You know, that, that little point right there stands out to me the most, that sharp break, easy, deep water, shallow water access. That's where I'm going to look for my pre-spawn smallies. Um, and then take wind and stuff into consideration a lot. A lot of these big water lakes, your Great Lakes, Mille Lacs, stuff like that, uh, the wind is everything in the spring pre-spawn. Um, it's, it's blowing around that warm surface water. I mean, basically the windiest bank is going to be the warmest water you'll find all day on these really, really big water bodies of water. Just pushes it all over. Yeah, that, that, and that's just going to trigger fish to bite. A pre-spawn small, is a, it's a pretty moody critter. It, it can be the dumbest thing you've ever met or the most stubbornest fish you've ever seen. Um, especially if you don't have the right conditions. You're really looking for wind, clouds, stuff like that. A lot of this water is really gin clear, so um, those are kind of the conditions you need to get a really good bite out of. But definitely those deep water access points to the shallow plats, to the places they're going to spawn, is what I'm going to look at for pre-spawn smallmouths. Thank you. Let me talk real quick. You're going for largemouths pre-spawn? Yeah. Uh, we can go to a reservoir. Reservoir? Yeah. We just did that. We're already past. That's spawn. winter, though. You can, oh, you like a pre-spawn? That, pre that was kind of real winter. Like what I was winter, first talking winter, about. Yeah, okay. I mean, like when the water's just starting to warm up, it, it's still going to be a lot of stuff they actually winter on. Um, but like I said, those uh, those ditches, those creek channels, those river channels—that's what all the fish are going to use to travel through. What are we talking about? Pre-spawn? Yeah, go? Pre let's pull up a reservoir. Uh, almost all reservoirs pretty much lay out the same. Something on a river. Doesn't matter. Gunnersville. Gunnersville. Gunnersville's got a lot of good pre-spawn. Yeah. 
Gunnersville, uh, it's kind of a bridge deal on the free spawn stuff. Everybody knows it, but those are those bridges are good for a reason. Those those are pinch points in the ditches that those fish are using to go into the spawn. Um, you know, okay. one thing too, those bridges are going to be really good. Um, also, vegetation areas, the right kind of pad stems seem to get really good free spawn areas. Yeah, running there with like a a swim jig and move water and, and catch those fish that stay. It's it's all about the bottom too. It's got the right yeah. kind of bottom. It retains heat. It gets a little warmer. Uh, temperature, watching your temperature on your graph is huge this time of year. Yeah. Here's Gunnersville. Here's your main channel right here. We got a nice ditch running in. This is, uh, what, Mud, Mud Creek. Creek. I'm no expert on Gunnersville by any means. Mud but. Creek's good. Pretty okay. Strong, <laughs> um, these fish are going to use this this ditch. Um, see if I can zoom in on this a little bit. They're going to follow this ditch to come in. They came out of the main river. That's where they spent their winter. They're coming in here. Any of these little key structure spots along here are going to be really good stuff to look at for free spots. Stop. You time. see, you got a little little point here, a little point here, a little hump here. I mean, all stuff right off of this main channel. This is where the fish are going to. If you follow my cursor, this is where these fish are coming in here. They're wanting to get, and like I said, I don't know gunners that well, so take into all this the with a grain of salt. But this, this is where they're going to want to go. Back up in here. This is the shallowest, warmest, most protected water. This is where they're going to head to spawn. But all these spots along this little deep, deeper um, little ditch through here, you can kind of see it. They got it marked on this Navionics map, this old riverbed. That's what the fish are going to use to stop. That's why these bridges are so good. There are little pinch points right along that ditch. They have to go through. They have to, they have to swim through that bridge to get there. And there's, and there's food. It's there's, a stop zone. Yeah, and there's they, 50 they guys waiting there with eight rigs to catch them, and they catch them every single day. Um, it's no secret. Um, that's just – they're stopping points, like I said. So following that creek channel, that's definitely what you want to look for. And even spots where it swings up against the bank, those are good spots to look for too. Anything that creek channel hits that a fish can pull up on and sit, I mean, we can run this creek channel out. This point right here is probably good. Run this creek channel down a little bit further. You got a little swing on the bank. That'd that is be something, good. That'd be something to look at. Um, you know, you're coming out here. Right here is a good Coming spot. out here now, it gets all, that? you're making a lot of turns, you know. This little flat right here, this high spot, this hump, this little point right here, this channel. That's a back. staging area. That, those are definitely spots figures. you're going to look at along the way. That's their migration route. It's a little different natural lakes. We don't have stuff like that. They aren't flooded out rivers, but uh, almost all reservoirs will semi-fish similar. They're going to use that deep water to access um, from where they winter to where they're going to spawn. And a lot of times, too, when you look at your map, you got to be realistic to what fishery it is that you're fishing. You know, yeah. Gunnersville is one, and if you're talking pre-spawn tournament, you're not looking for a fish or two. You're not looking for five or six bites. You need to catch 20 to 30 pounds to be com competitive on that fishery every day. So you need to find spots where, where schools of fish are going to congregate. It, it's not yeah. just a one or two fish in this, in this little area here. This is the, uh, an area where everything is stopped and going right there. Yeah, and the, 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 these spots don't load up overnight. I mean, if you find something along here that they really like, say there's a little shell bed on this little high spot right here with some grass around it, and it's just an awesome spot for them to feed. I mean, constantly, these migration routes are the same going in as they are coming out. You can find a spot like this where you'll catch pre-spawn and post-spawn fish at somewhere they're going to stop, feed up there before they head in, and – and then when they're coming out, they'll stop and load up on the same spot. Um, and you're just going to have constant, fresh fish replenishing on areas like this when you find the right one. So much so you can sit on a spot sometimes, oh, stay yeah. on it all tournament day, and you are you feel you're making the same damn cast over and over and over again. But that's because there's literally fish moving in and yeah. moving out of that while you're there. You just yeah. got fresh ones. I mean, isn't that always the goal? Yeah. Are, I got them coming to me. These are little you feeding stations along their migration route. Along. Should we get in the spawn? Yeah, we can do We're spawn. Right yeah, we're on the same it. map. Yeah. Um, and like I said, I'm, I'm no Gunnersville expert, so if you, if you know Gunnersville well, some of the stuff I'm pointing yeah, on the map might not be that great. But I'm going to look for – I fished Gunnersville one time, and the banks are kind of shallow, but I'm sure there's some deeper ones. But um, – any of these little protected pockets is where I'm going to look at, you know, all these I would look at. And, you know, maybe you might not even be able to get a boat on these on Gunnersville. I don't know. But the backs of these pockets. Um, and then the backs of the creeks and stuff. This is where, you know, 
a lot of your fish this is gonna this is gonna warm up the first the fastest a lot of your fish are gonna come in here and spawn all this stuff way back in here this is all gonna warm up quick it's protected a lot of fish are gonna spawn back in this at the beginning stages of the spawn um the spawn definitely has phases you know if you're there right when the first few fish are starting to spawn this is the stuff i'm going to concentrate in if you're let's say you're coming in on the tail end of the spawn a uh, little main lake stuff like this see this little pocket down here um that's where your later you know your later tail end of the spawn fish are gonna fish are gonna focus on that area you know you got these old main main river creeks and stuff coming in right here um that'd be stuff i'd look at towards the tail end of the spawn and at the beginning of the spawn i'm gonna go you know all the way to the backs of like every little pocket up in here i'm gonna you know run this stuff towards the beginning of the spawn and the tail end of the spawn we're gonna back out um let's get on a natural lake here and talk about spawn And it's going to be real similar. Um, we'll pull up Tonka. Um, any of these little, you see these little cuts and stuff out of here. This is all good, oh, obvious yeah. spawning stuff. A lot of times your first stuff, right? Yeah. Like I said, towards the beginning of the spawn. Later in the spawn, then you're going to start to see fish spawning, you know, maybe around these islands, main lake, stuff like that. Um, but you know, you got to factor in what part of the spawn are you in. When you put the boat in and the main water is 50 degrees and all the way back in a little pocket, it gets to 60, you're at the beginning of the spawn. Yep. When you put it on the main lake and it's 65, you're at the tail end of the spawn. Um, you want to start looking main lake shorelines. Um, islands are always great spots to look um, around boat docks. But then, like I said earlier in the spawn, these little pockets, these are where these fish are going to spawn. It's the only places it's warm enough for them to spawn at that time. It's protected back in here, back in here, all this stuff, all these little cuts. Um, that's what I'm looking at early in the spawn. And then uh, small mouse, a little different deal. We'll go over where we at here. Get more main lake. It really doesn't matter on the map. But, um, you know, these bigger flats. Rock reef. Stuff like. And knowing what they're going to want like to spawn this. around, too. They yeah. want rock. They want rock. Uh, I wouldn't say that. Rock sand. They want yeah. hard bottom, yeah. and they'll spawn on anything. I've seen them spawn on a pop can. I've seen them spawn on a cinder block. They're, but they like to have something. They like to have there's something. A stick. There. There's going to be something there. Yeah. Boulder, tires. You know tires it. are awesome. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. If you find a tire on a flat, there's going to be a small, small spawn. Oh, yeah. But that's the stuff you want to record. The spawn's pretty easy. Um, it's definitely going to be shallow. That's, take that with a grain of salt, depending on what lake you're on. That might be 8 to 10 feet. That might be a foot of water. Um, it's definitely going to be shallower. Look for protected areas, you know, little bays and islands, cuts, canals, stuff like that. Um, pretty simple. Put the trolling motor on high, zip through them areas, get you a good pair of amphibia glasses so you can see good. Um, Probably your best asset for yeah, fishing. Get a good pair of glasses and uh, cover a lot of water. And and pay it, another thing I noticed, you really pay attention, especially on large mouse. A lot of them fish you see up in those cuts. A lot more of them are on beds than you actually think. You uh, take a mental note when you see fish. If you come through a little cut, not not every bed is going to be a great big white spot. It just isn't, especially with large today. mouse. We're doing that today. Um, out there. If you Trying see to it, figure out where it's home is. Where's if you that go is. into a cut and there's just a fish just sitting there, you know, maybe there's a little stick or something you're sitting by it, and you come out and the fish is sitting around that stick again, even though the bottom looks brown mud whatever uh that fish is probably on a bed um and if a lot of times in practice i like to just pull down and just watch them you know if you see a good fish that you know you want in the tournament a four pound you know wherever you may be depending on the size of the fish but if you see a good fish i like to watch them for a little bit watch them for 10 minutes if he keeps going back and sitting on the same little That's spot it's Especially probably if a bed if you're bait there and they do anything yeah. goofy at all it's probably a bed so don't always be looking for them giant white spots but uh that's more about spawning fish and maps. So, um, we're on going into the pole. One thing too, I want to touch on, like you said, <laughs> how many times have we seen in tournaments? Uh, you think the spawn is done, 
you think it's wrapped up and like you said it's about the main leg just because they're not in the yeah. traditional spawning areas it's more the untraditional spawning areas maybe there's that dot post or but it never fails every time we think it's post spawn the spawn's over and somebody wins the tournament yeah. on spawning bass still the spawn sure. lasts a long time i mean you're talking there's going to be a couple months where you're just going to have fish in all three phases, you know, pre-spawn, spawn, spawn. Especially and spawn. down south. And even so, up here still. Yeah, I mean, for sure. Down Especially south, they can stretch de depending on when. Well, yeah. In Florida, they might go December yeah, to Yeah, there's five March. months of spawning in Florida April. probably. I'm no Florida expert, but I, I know they start spawning down there in probably December. and They're still spawning. Just they're, waves them. But they're all obviously more temperamental to that water temperature and stuff like that too. Yeah. Post-spawn early summer? Okay. Is that where we're at? Yep. Keeping on talking? Or yeah, we can. Go? We'll start with some uh, – some, uh, go on talking. Go? Um, like I said, you're basically following these fish all year long. Um, Keep them tagged okay. on. Let's, all right. Here's Maxwell. Here's an, this little bay right here. A lot of fish will spawn in here. Um, you're basically following them out. You know, they're going to take that deep wheat – you know, your weed edge is basically your river channel in a natural lake. Um, they're going to follow that out. You know, you got a bunch of fish spawning in here. They come out here. I know right here, this is a big rock spine. Fish are going to stop on that or depending on the water clarity and um, grass growth, they might, the weeds typically are better before the rocks um, early in the spring. But somewhere along here, there's going to be a good, uh, you know, they're making their way out to this main area. This is where they're going to spend their summer. We'll just take this bay as an example. This is Maxwell. The fish are going to summer out here in this. This is where they're going to spend their time. They spawned up in here, maybe along these banks. Maybe they went up into stubs and spawned up in this bank. They might spawn. Um, they're going to go to the best grass they can find. So you're just going to have to get out here. And it might not be that structural. Yeah, points are obvious places for them to stop, more so on reservoirs than natural lakes. But um, if you get some good grass along here, a lot of fish are going to stop in that grass right there before they move out. You know, you know, maybe they call this point summer or uh, this hump out here is their summer home. Um, you know, you're just following them. They all spawn back here. They got to swim out here. They can't. There's no other option. They can't get on land. Um, so this point would be a real obvious place to look for them. Like I said, you're just trying to follow them to their summer places. And a lot of fish will stay shallow post spawn. I, I see a lot of guys give up on it, but that's actually a good time to catch some decent fish you're gonna have fry garters up in here it's always a great a place thing. to fish with a frog wacky inside sanko inside grass lines um there's still gonna be fish shallow year round so don't think every fish is going out here some fish will stay fairly deep all year and some fish will stay fairly shallow but the majority of the fish are gonna summer in deeper water um so that's uh and as does the bay i mean you look at like the bluegills and all that right now we're up in shallow water chasing around betters yep. and stuff and it's just full of life i mean absolutely i got a video on it it's coming out soon it's about showing you today how many crappies and bluegill oh, yeah. are there i mean it's amazing everything's shallow and the majority is saying those bluegills that get out on some of those points and you know you idle over them and it's like same as what the shad do they start get shallow and spawn and they start moving out deep let's pull up a reservoir around here which one you want the bend something more reservoir than uh Gunnersville. It's kind of more rivery. You got the bend? There's a good old fashioned What's Highland this? Reservoir. Highland Reservoir. We're just coming in. Uh, like, just, That's Table Rock. Pull her up. Let's do Beaver. All right. Table Rock? Never fish. Whatever. They're all the same. How about Bull Shoals? Sure. Okay. You're just there. Yep. Makes oh, fish, so. no, I'm doing that. Okay. That wasn't just me. Okay. Same deal. Um, like I said, our fish spawning. Um, this is where they're going to spawn on most of your reservoirs. Um, these backs of these pockets, up around the bushes, all that stuff like that. A lot of pea gravel. It, it yep. transitions into that easy, easy something for them to spawn, but, or even that slate rock. Yeah, it's good. the same deal Flat. as pre-spawn. Okay, let's let's just take this little tiny creek as an example. Okay, move around a bit. Okay. Our fish, you know, they spawn back here. Boom, 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 right boom. Back of these. Yeah. Is too. Yep. Back of these. This is where all our fish spawn. Okay. Now, as soon as they spawn, they're going to slide out into this creek channel, and they're going to work their way out. 
And you just got to look at stuff they're going to hit on the way up. Boom, you got a little secondary point right here. Fish are probably going to stop on that. Then they come out, and you got a major point at the mouth of this creek. All this stuff back in here, all these bed, fish right spawn. Right there. Yeah, road bed swinging in on the point. Got to have something hard This around. is where your fish are coming. This creek channel is a road. You just got to think of it that way. This is a highway all these fish are using. All these fish that spawn back in here, they're coming right out here. They slide out here, boom, they're on the main channel. Secondary channel here. They, I'm sure they got some current swinging through here. This is going to be an awesome place to look. Um, they like just like hunting. Any uh, you hunters also out there this too. this little point coming out here right at the mouth of this. You know this is where these fish are going to spend their summers. They're going to sit out deep on this stuff, eat shad. Uh, you know if table rocks a little different. Maybe they might be on boat docks, brush piles, whatever. They're going to head out towards this main river. This is where the fish are summering. Um, anywhere they stop, you know. Like it's like Douglas said, there's stop signs. You know, you're coming out this channel, you're a fish swimming, boom, you hit this point. There's a bunch of shad here. You're eating, you're fat, you're happy, life's good. Um, and, that, and that's where your post spawn fish are gonna go. And that's gonna that's gonna be the same place your summer fish are. Um, another thing though, there, like I said, don't get. There's different types of fish. You know, some fish are gonna want to stay shallow year round. Some fish, majority of your fish are gonna follow seasonal patterns some fish will stay deep all year um even post spawn you know back in here these bluegills are going to spawn right after the bass do in these same little pockets there will be a good uh bluegill bed bite right as the fish are done spawning before they come out here so um, remember the bluegill pesker the heck out of the bass right now we saw it on gopro okay. video it was insane to be able to see it underwater camera not around there the bass will return that favor as soon as they're done spawning and they'll hang around all them bluegill beds and they'll hang yeah. out there. They'll get, they'll get back to, you know, they don't eat when they're spawning. You have to kind of remember that they don't, they're only eating out of moving something or try to get it away from their bed. They're, they don't actually eat when they're spawning. So then it's the feed bag time, but they, they've also are wore down. They've been chasing bluegills away. They've been chasing minnows and fishermen and everything else away and actually spawning. Now it's time to eat up. They don't quite got their energy. They kind of take their time on their way out, stopping at those. And a lot of some, times the same secondary points on the – some of the secondary points on the way in, they're hitting those same secondary points on the way out. Yeah. Some fish do. There's some places where you go that – I mean, the second they spawn, they swim right out to the main river. We saw it today. They were gone. I brought them into an area yeah. where I had like five beds. There was one little – three yeah. pounder in there and that was it and that was days in there, and out. there's also a shad spawn going on typically right after the That'll bass slow spawn. Them down a little bit. that's another thing they're going to keep them shallow a little longer but every place you go to is different um they're going to follow the same paths that deep water channel no matter where you're at um in the country um some places just fish a little different than others like i said uh you know there's some places you go i'm sure you know uh kentucky lakes one of them you know any of those good ledge places a lot of those fish as soon as they spawn they're swimming out to that stuff and that's just that's the majority um, of where the bait goes yeah, you know it's the same deal some stay shallow and they're eating a bluegill a week and the other ones are, are on the ledge yeah, that's why you see some of those big mouth skinny ones up shallow it's just like fishermen some of us prefer to fish shallow some prefer to fish yeah. deep bass prefer shallow some prefer deep yeah but this, this is all stuff you can do at home before you ever get to the For lake. For sure, knowing where you're at, doing yeah. a little research on what it takes at the lake, what kind of stuff they like, and understanding, like, Mud Creek in Gunnersville has a lot of hydrilla. Yeah. Hydrilla is important when you're on Gunnersville. You want to make sure you're around it. Post, are we done with post spawn early summer? I think, I think so. so. People going to keep the questions coming. Anything you want us to indulge back in, please yeah. by all means. And we're kind of going to switch more to northern stuff here. Um, some of we're talking. I'm not a re, I'm not a reservoir expert, but I mean, there's not a lot of. I could talk, but I got I spent I spent some years down there. Yeah. I actually had but a lot once of once they legs. get out, they're up. after post spawn. They're gonna be there. They're gonna get harder to catch because people are beating on them. Like they're gonna be on them man. same little. And we should let's actually pull up a good show, oh, yeah, a good worry. like ledge lake. Well, no. I'll go to like, well, yeah, Kentucky, but I know sure. Chickamauga well. Let's sure. go there. Where are we? And let's pull up a TVA lake quick, which is. The, the place for ledge fishing yeah just so we can show you kind of what um 
like summer pattern Your stuff summer for reservoir here, I mean. fish this is this is starting as soon as they're done spawning through and these fish are going to be on this here's stuff down by the dam the front fall. the river runs this way right here yeah. it pulls and creates you shell beds you get all up yeah. in front of that point right there yeah. and it it sounds backwards if you're like a true river fisherman because you when you fish largemouth you always want to be on the downside st side yes. of stuff where fish are hiding point. out of the current but ledge fishing's a little bit different these fish are actually going to sit on the upstream side of this stuff um they don't they're not dealing with near as much current as like a true river you know and, you know you go to the mississippi they're, river you they're might dying be for current actually yeah. they might not bite until the buoys are yeah. sideways they want yeah. the current like, that's what gets everything moving on the mississippi river up here i mean there's times in the spring and stuff we got four or five mile maybe even more mile an hour current those fish are not sitting in that whereas you come to a tva lake you know if you're getting a, a mile an hour of current is probably a lot Yes. Like they're snapping if you get something like that. So these fish will actually sit on the front side of these points. Um, I'm actually glad we brought up one of these lakes. Um, let's see if we can find a real good example. What are you for? Um, just something that, okay. I don't know how this map lays out. But okay, we got this crick arm back here. You know, a lot of your fish are going to spawn in these pockets and stuff. Um, they're going to slide out, use this. Anywhere you get these, uh, a lot of these TVA lakes, you'll see um, they got the main channel, and then you'll have kind of a higher ridge, and then the a old dip. river bank. It's the old old river, river bank before they flooded it. Then you'll have a ditch, and then it'll come Second up shallow area. again. Yeah. Uh, when most people are talking about ledge bites, they're talking about this main river ledge, and this is know, a ledge. Right some here. points and stuff here. This this high spot along the river bank is what people are calling a ledge. Um, okay, so. Now, you see we got these few pockets down here. This is where our fish spawn. Let's follow them out. They're going to go down this road bed. They might slide down here or take this ditch in. Yeah. But right here looks like an obvious spot. I've never fished this on Chickamauga. But, okay, we got all these pockets and stuff in here. Our fish spawn. They slide out here through this river ditch. Then, boom, you got this high spot right here. Looks like a really good spot. A little deeper hole right here. Um, let's just say 30 feet. Then it's going to slide up on this 21, 18. Sure it's going to break yep. and go through there. Plus, you got to swing on the river, so you're you're talking extra current right here. Um, that's an obvious spot to look for ledge fish, right there on that little high spot or this little high spot. Your fish will sit right on the front edge of those high spots, right where that current's actually hitting it the most. Typically, going to have shell there. Um, oh, not just shell. You're, I mean, a lot of times you're you're electronic. Like, I always tell people when you go to a TBA like for the first time, just idle and idle and idle. You will know for sure when you find a school, it'll light up like a. I mean, white bass will be there, striped bass will be there, yeah. catfish, bass. It's it's a feeding station. Yeah. It's, it's a spot where everything can sit and, yeah. and can feed on. And this this is another little sneaky spot I'd look at too. You got kind of a secondary ditch running out through here. The fish will follow that out towards the main river channel. You got a couple humps here. Um, you know, maybe the front edge of this hump right here or the front edge of that little hump right there. It'll be really good spots to look for them. Um, along with this, this front end, I mean, that's a pretty obvious spot. A bunch of current's going to be hitting that. It says it has stumps breaking, on it yeah. even better. Um, so with reservoirs, um, that's pretty much where your fish are going to be for the majority of the summer into the fall. So we're going to talk about natural lakes. I think they go through quite a bit more changes throughout um in typical su su summer months where you go um you can go to Malax, tonka whatever all right here's Malax. something like that you got a garrison reef is good structure around here we can Give you some examples of stuff. And with summer smallmouths, um, depending on where you're at, uh, you, the summer, those fish aren't really, like, set on being in a certain depth. Um, conditions kind of dictate more when I'm going to fish. Uh, and believe it or not, if it gets slick, calm, and sunny, that's actually the best time to go shallow, even in the middle of the summer for smallmouths. And uh, I actually, like, prefer fishing deeper when it's, you know, windy cloudy you know that might be what most people would consider better shallow water conditions but uh it's the exact opposite for me for small mouse um you know let's see down here garrett this is garrison reef ton of little humps on here big reef system these fish love to go out to main lake reefs in the summer um 
Let's pull this out a little bit. Um, and the fish will spawn on those reefs. You know, this is where I would look for later spawners, but a lot of your early spawners are going to come up in here, get on this shallow stuff out of the, out of the wind, um, protected um, rock transition stuff. But summertime, they want to get out on these reefs. Um, like I said, conditions dictate it. If it's calm and sunny, I'm going to look at all these little high spots. That's where I'm going to go. I'm going to actually visually try to see bass swimming around on them and then try to catch them. Cloudy and windy, I'm going to look for uh, your deeper stuff. Here's the obvious deal. The furthest tip that sticks out into the main lake, great summer spot. And then uh, these sharp breaks and stuff in here. I like to fish these. They're really good year-round, to be honest with you. Um, with uh, the exception of spawning fish. But uh, spring, summer, fall. These are just awesome transitions for uh, fish to use to access deep and shallow water. Um, and use your electronics, use your graphs, you know. You'll be able to see these fish if you get out in this deeper water. And then if you get up shallow, get you a good pair of polarized sunglasses. Mostly smallmouth places are really clear. You can see fish. Um, I get on that trolling motor a lot and just run her hard and actually look for fish. Um, One thing, too, to keep in mind, a lot, a lot of everything Seth's been talking about as we're going through here, uh, relate to a break and 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 then on the other side of it they're always around a high spot a pump or a flat and a lot of times that's the dinner table and especially in the summertime so many fish eat at night they in those shallows they push the shallows i don't care if it's walleyes bass anything they all get caught at night and they, they push they push up into them shallows so they want to stay really close to their their supper table i mean uh, that's where that's where every that's where the everything's going on and they slide off and they can just go vertical up and down, yeah. not exhaust. Their only job outside of the spawn is to eat and stay alive. Those are the two things that they want to do outside of the spawn uh, that, that they go about. So one, not exhausting a lot of energy trying to find food will keep them strong and alive. And so anything they can slide up vertical, they will yeah. almost always be a flat of some sort around, around an area like that, especially in the summertime. Yeah. Then uh we're gonna do large mouse here. Yeah. I mean I can go to a different lake, but we we can go to Tonk if you want, whatever. Um this one works just fine. You just threw half the audience a bone and went to a different lake. Whatever. <laughs> um and like I said, you're always gonna have fish shell. I mean, like, up north, I mean, there ain't a day that goes by there ain't a fish sitting underneath a boat dock or in some slop eating a frog. But your majority of your fish are going to come out to the main lake to summer or where your best grass is. The deepest, tallest, thickest grass you can find, guarantee will have fish in it. And cooler water temperatures. The shallows can get really warm, yeah. especially in the south. Yeah. Especially in the south. They Gra grass is great insulation, and it works both ways. If it's cold, it holds heat, and if it's hot, it holds colder temperatures. It's like insulation in your house. Um, you know, but I'm going to look for really main lakey stuff. We've got a big hump out here. Um, these points, these turns, all this stuff out on this main deal is what I'm going to look at for summer large mouse. And a lot of it's going to be, you know, if I get out on these, like, humps and points, you know, I'm probably going to be, you know, the ends of these, these little points here, they're probably going to have hard bottom on them. That stuff I'm going to look at. You can see this flat point runs out off this hump. I don't know if I ever fished this lake, but that's going to be hard bottom right there. Um, great stuff to look for. Same deal. You see that little flat spot on that point? I can guarantee you right there is hard bottom. Guarantee you. It might be sand. Sure. It might be the biggest We're boulders you've ever so seen. But I guarantee that's going to be hard bottom. Something. Otherwise, that and would roll. We yeah. talked about that. Yeah, and then right here you're going to have a, you know probably a weed edge. Right along that break, it's going to go weed edge right into rock. Great spot to look. And uh, that, you know, fish for fish on the outside edge. There's going to be fish in thick milfoil, thickest grass. It's going to have it in it, you know. And that's something your mapping's not going to do a ton for you. That's a really visual thing, you know. I, I'll just, if I'm grass fishing, I'm just going to put the trawl mower down, say right here, put that thing on high and flip, you yeah. know. If I see something that looks better than the rest of it, you know, say this is all kind of straggly, and then right here it gets really thick. Uh, Mill foil, obviously, that's something I'm going to spend a little more time on. And, uh, you know, then I'm just going to keep going. Keep that trawl motor going, flip, 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 all the way down that. It's a, it's a time-consuming deal. But uh, 
you can definitely use your mapping to some extent. You know, points inside turns Rock like points this. Are always good. Football jig, Carolina yeah. rig, and like we said, we talked about before, finding how bottom stuff. Just point yeah. them out. The map can show you Stru- right where those structure are. Structure is going to be key, but with grass fishing, realistically, it's where the best grass yeah. is. But if you find a, a really juicy clump of milfoil right on that point, it's probably going to be a really good spot. You know, whereas if you found, you know, a really good patch of milfoil kind of on the straighter stuff, it might it might not be as great. But it might be a little more overlooked. So if you're dealing with heavy fishing pressure, you know, these kind of like bare, nothing-looking banks is kind of what I focus on. If there's a lot of stuff, if, uh, you know, it's getting beat on pretty hard. But if it's not your, your main points, your main turns, it's – that's uh, that's where most of your fish are going to be. There's no doubt. We can definitely give you all the tips in the world on how to break down, but you still got to be a fisherman at the end of the day, too, and, and have a nose for them, figure out where they're going to want to be, and, and knowing stuff like that, like our boy Andy Young, just as he's in the house. You didn't what get up? my text? Yeah. <laughs> you didn't, th- you didn't think that was funny? We're on a fall. Last one. That's your son. Getting in the <laughs> – we're going to get into some fall fishing. Uh, last one, then we'll get into all them questions. Yeah. They're going shallow, aren't they? Yep. Yeah. Uh, typically, the fall is a really spread out time of year. And like any time of year, up, up in anywhere you go, there's shallow fish and deep fish. But we're going to talk about what the majority of the fish do. Um, and that shallow bite will start really quick in the fall. A lot of guys are really late to the party coming to it. Those first few nights you get. It might still be 80 degrees that day, but if it got down to 30, 40 degrees that night, that that triggers stuff. Shells start coming alive that time of year. A lot of your big fish are going to pull up in pads, slop, docks, lay downs, depending on water clarity, uh, stuff like that. And they're dumb. They're aggressive. They're they're up there to do one thing. That's to eat, get ready for winter. Um, and they're eating. It's my favorite time of year. Just put a jig on the deck and just throw it at everything you come across docks lay downs whatever just like you said too and it's, it's a, lot, a lot like the old wise man i mean he knows when things are coming when things are going a lot of times your bigger bass will spawn first and you're i mean again the changes throughout the lake but the big ones know when things are happening they also know on the reverse side they're ahead of the game they've been there for a few years they've seen it and they'll push shallow quicker and obviously yeah. the name of our game is bigger fish for always look for bigger ones yeah, and with the fall bite, um, those deep rocks, I've seen lakes where they're still a factor, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time fishing deep rocks this time of year. Uh, your grass is starting to die. That good milfoil we've been fishing all year is starting to die off, so that's going to concentrate a lot of fish. There's not going to be near as many, uh, near as many good stretches of grass for them to be in. So what is left is going to be really good. And then also your shallows, docks are an awesome thing to fish this time of year. Good hard cover up shallow, um, pads, slop. Um, they're up there to put the feed bag on. There's no doubt about it. And a lot of them weeds die. You know, yeah. the weeds are dying. Start pushing yeah, everything's the dying. We'll talk about There's they less and less them. cover. It's it's your dock fishing starts getting really good that really time of year. So using your net again, using the Navionics map for looking at the yeah, docks. And you, you can pat, you can pattern the docks. You know. That's the awesome thing about Navionics I don't see on other cards. They actually show the docks. Literally, and how they'll break they show up. Them. Okay. They, they've handwritten in each one of the docks how they saw it on yeah. like satellite imagery. And let's say we catch one way up on the flat, these big flat docks. I like these in the fall. Right there. Let's say we catch one there. We can run to the, you know, the yeah, next spot. Yeah, you don't get a bite on, through the next of them, start looking for one. The next spot on the lake, like I can pull up my Navionics map and look across the lake. I find another flat point like this with a dock on it. I run right there and I can catch one. It's going to save you a ton of time. Or the exact opposite. Let's say we catch one on this dock. You can see it's on that sharp shoreline break. There's a dock right there. You know, we can run around. Let's look. Uh, you know, we got a swing in here with a couple docks on it, a swing in here with a couple There's docks couple on flat. it, or vice versa. If we caught them on the flat, you know, this is the next spot I'm going to run. I'm going to come hit these couple docks that are up on that shallower stuff. Um, you know. It's just, it really helps you pattern your stuff. You know, here's another swing with a dock on it. You know, here's another deep swing with some docks on it. Um, and one thing, too, what I didn't talk about, and I probably should real quick, uh, the docks will be there no matter what. But one nice thing with the Navion's Platinum card and or the, the mobile apps is you can, instead of using this yellow, if you want, you can overlay satellite imagery and see. I, I don't use that a ton, to be honest, but I have used it before. Uh, it was the springtime. I had a really nice lay down bite going, I think, on Table Rock. 
and I wanted to see which bays had less houses and had more not houses because if there's a house there generally they keep their they're not going to let a tree fall down into the water and just stay there they're going to get it out of there so i can see areas that don't have houses because when those trees hit the deck they stay there nobody's there to take them out this is a good job should we start going to the q a hey i'm coming on my phone now yeah. i figure out to switch this thing back quick um, well, we let me should, let's oh, do fall a little bit on reservoir oh, okay, okay. Res that's, that's a real good we'll call. that's southern boys um, in the fall, uh, same deal. Once you start getting that colder weather, and that's a lot later in the south, you know, this might be November by the time a good uh, fall bite happens on. But uh, for some reason, all those shad want to run to the back of the pockets. I don't know if the water's a little warmer up there or what the deal is, but um, the shad love getting back in all these little pockets in the fall. And, you know, fish school, and it's a great a time to catch water. them. Like oh, dirty super shad. shallow. You know, rattle traps. Top a crank waters. bait you can even run is a t yeah. is your biggest problem. Great time of year to throw top waters. I, I don't know what it is about it, but um, <laughs> the, the the shad love to get back in these creeks in the fall, and uh, that's something that it, it happens quick too. You know, you can be up shallow one day and just nothing's going on, and then the next day there's shad everywhere, and the bass are with them chasing them. So that, that's that's something for the reservoir guys. I, yeah. I haven't fished down south a ton in the fall, but the couple times I've been there, the backs of the pockets, the shad really, really relate to. So that's a good place to check. And I, you know, you're just going to follow your same, the, the reservoirs are, they're pretty easy. You know what I mean? Uh, they're roadmaps, you know, these fish, you know, they say they, this Fort Gibson, so it's a bad example. The fish kind of live dirt shallow there year round, but let's just pretend it's a normal lake. And these fish get out on this stuff, you know, in the summer, and then when them shad come by and they're just going to follow this ditch, right through here right, right into the back of it so anything along that way before they get there is going to be good and then they really love pushing these they get the all these shad get up shallow and they'll just run them right into nothing water in the backs of those pockets uh super shallow it's a fun time of year to fish down there yeah and we talk about maps all the time and understanding where bass are going to be but I, th I think it was actually a quote rick clun said and something on the 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 line of you know you want to understand the southern largemouth bass understand the shad you want to understand uh smallies understand the crayfish so knowing where those fish are going to go they know you know where that t-bone is in your fridge and what it's doing at all times they know where the shad is going to be where the crawfish is going to be they're going to go there that's just you know they're one step ahead of you at all times so knowing where they're at is hugely important figure out how to get back to this webinar with our Bree here or no Bree is here you can just hit that and begin. No, oh, hold on. I got to finish that one deal out here. It's new share. All right. All right. Here you go, guys. Again, we're going to wrap this webinar up. Open this thing up to Q&A. If you haven't, keep them coming. Yeah. Uh, view our previous webinars, as we said. Um, we, of course, we put them out there for the learning for everybody who can't make it. We apologize for those that couldn't be on on the dates we choose, but we do put them out there for everybody uh, to be able to view. I'm not changing. Sorry, guys. Bam. All right, our next webinar. Again, this was the number. This was the number two. July, right? Oh yeah, it's July twenty first. That's Sorry. our fault. That's our fault. July 21st. That's your breeze fault. My bad. <laughs> well, uh, again, okay, sorry, guys. July 21st, we'll have that change, and we'll put it up, let everyone know. Uh, I'm going to try to figure out for our viewers, just so you know, I'm trying to figure out a way to take your, your emails and put it into just like a once-a-month mailer that goes out to just remind everybody and let notes, uh, emails go. I'm just trying to figure out if anyone has any input on how I can do that efficiently, please, by all means, send it to me. I'll probably be out fishing, but I'll definitely get on it. Uh, so July 21st, it's a Thursday night, our next webinar. This was actually the second thing that people asked for. So we're just yeah. going on with that one. It's finesse. It's well, going to be a good one. We had one. a lot of finesse fishing. We had a lot of clear water, and we both looked at each other. So let's put them together. It's kind of one in one. So finesse fishing and yeah. clear water. We like using spinning poles. We like it. Lots of good time. stuff here. And then thank you to these companies. Again, these companies are huge for us. They promote us. They promote our webinar. And they are all about getting good products and good information out to all of you. Uh, so please, by all means, check out these websites. And Navionics. Navionics, you can get a hold of us. Navionics puts on these webinars for everybody. 
Um, this one was pretty Navionics heavy, but they're not always. I mean, we yeah. they want whatever. We, we, we decide our content. You guys decide our content. Uh, by all means, that's our emails. Contact us. Direct message us. Hit Seth up in the DM. Anything. Sorry, it goes down. Get us. And now, how do we get to the Q and A right here? Yeah. Yeah. We got a lot. All right, guys, bear with us. We're gonna get back to where we were. Okay. I got a question here. Uh, have I used 3D imaging yet? What do you think about it? Advantage, disadvantages? There is no disadvantages to, to 3D. That's a Lowrance product. It's new. It is absolutely awesome. I, as far as the actual 3D feature, um, it's nice. I'm playing with it still. I'm still trying to get good at it. It just came out. Um, with that being said, though, it's 100% worth the investment in just what I'm getting out of structure scan alone. I can see, I already thought I, w I had everything I needed. The detail's amazing, and better yet, I'm shoot I can shoot out like 100 feet to each side in a foot and a half of water and see every single stump that's on that deal. I'm telling you, 3D is worth it, um, but I'm still learning the actual 3D functionality. Uh, I think it'll be a giant player for our southern anglers that have creek channels, river channels, that kind of view to be able to see where them sweet spot spots stack up. Uh, go back up to that quick. Uh, first time watching, how often do you do a video and can you, you watch? Oh, did we do my bad? Okay. Post spawn, you never answered that one. You said we can get to that one. Post spawn larges, where do they go? What's the best way to go about finding them? Uh, so like I said, some of them will still say around those beds will be fry garters. There's going to be some fish shallow. Um, a lot of them are going to go out to hard bottom, rock piles, or the deepest, thickest grass you can find. How do you guys feel about a thunderstorm or big fronts affecting bed fish this time of year? Um, yeah, that's a great question. I don't know. I don't know if a thunderstorm would do much to them. Okay. Um, definitely cold fronts. Definitely cold fronts will push them off if they're not. Um, best way to, if the, a lot of those males will get up there a long time, especially with small mouths, more so than large mouths. They'll be on that bed for a long time before they actually lay anything down, depending on the spring. Um, if it warms up real quick and you hit a full moon, something perfect, it might just get crazy real quick. But, uh, um, you know, if a fish hasn't laid eggs, um, if there's a male there and it gets cold, yeah, he's going to pull off. There's no reason for him to be up there. But if he has spawned and there's eggs on that bed, he can't leave. Um, unless he's just going to scrap it and spawn again, he might, if it gets really bad, you know, if you get ice or something crazy. Um, but he's, he's, his job's to protect them eggs. I mean, if he leaves, the bluegills will eat them. So he's got to stay up there and do his thing. But fish that haven't actually spawned that are bedding um, will definitely pull off. Um, fish that haven't, I, I don't think they can leave, if that makes any sense. It totally does. Um, my fish and chip selection is grayed out on my unit. Do I need to update my card? Yeah, you do. You're, you need to download sonar charts to your card. You, it comes free for a year, everything you download on your card. I don't know how old your card is or anything, but I've done numerous videos on it. You can go to joshdouglasfishing.com, and I walk you through that process of how to actually up, upload uh, the sonar charts. Remember, you do need to update them. You need to tell it what you want because they're bringing 2000 a day. Um, so, and they're, they're free. They're, they're, they're available for you to do that. Um, was on Mille Lacs past weekend, found a flat with beds everywhere, went six miles south, fished another flat with the same bottom composition and not a bed anywhere. Why? Um, it maybe be. it wasn't as protected. Maybe just no fish spawn there. Um, just because it looks good doesn't mean it is good. That's true. Uh, or time of year, like you said, maybe the wind's been yeah. blowing one direction a bunch, keeping that water warm. Tip it. Typically on Mille Lacs, they spawn on the north end first and then work their way south. So maybe – but – with what it sounded like this weekend, it sounded like they were just on beds everywhere. So maybe there's just no fish spawn on that flat. Um, maybe they, you know, maybe they hadn't got to spawning yet. But um, you know, Mille Lacs is a weird lake because the entire 
I mean, essentially minus the basin, which is a mud flat. Um, the entire lake's pretty much sand and rock and looks awesome for a fish to spawn in. So it's not, there's no shortage of good spawning habitat on that lake. So, you know, maybe you're just in a terrible spot. Could be. I'd, I'd get on the boat and drive another mile to the next one. They're probably all over it. The fish aren't there. Fish aren't there. I mean, or, or maybe they're pre-spawn. Who knows? Yeah. Um, this is a, another great question. My hardest time of year is summer to fall transition. I think that's ev a lot of people's hard time of year to keep up with them. It is. It's it's really day to day. It, it, it's uh, conditional fishing, especially on Tonka. I've just I've seen falls where you know, let's say there's you know, you take a week, Monday, Tuesday, one, you know, seven days, and every other day the tournament would either be one shallow or deep. It, it's just uh. It's a tricky time of year, but if you got spots in both places and can run a couple of them early, you can get a pretty good feel for it and then just kind of roll it out. But uh, um, where was the actual question again? No, right here. Um, when what areas of the map do you look for and what techniques? Well, when a lake's turning over, uh, you know, I don't know if southern people have to deal they with do, that. They do, definitely. I had well, that last call. Lake, lake Norman had a bad okay. turnover. So um, like, when the lakes turn over, the best bite is typically – two foot or less um that's just the only place there's good water and big lakes they turn over in sections they do and that's um, the problem at norman you you can you can tell if you start seeing like black chunks of like just weird slimy stuff floating up that 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 section of the lake's turning over it's healing itself, you can get away sure. from that you know before it turns over is gonna fish pretty typical and then after it turns over is gonna fish pretty typical but during that turnover oh. typically the only place you're gonna get bit is super duper shallow um, a foot to two feet might be an exaggeration. It more, might be more six inches to a foot. And then still ain't biting that great. It's no, a but weird you, deal. You, can but you can catch, catch some fish. Sure. Um, but yeah, and a lot of times it gets ignored. Different lakes will get different lakes will turn over at different times. So you can kind of run away or or chase embrace it, whatever, whatever you want to turn do. over. Yep. Um, so, but while the lake is turning over, super duper shell. Uh, can you show what a channel looks like and what you mean by a channel swing? I think we kind okay. of got it. I mean, a, chan a reservoir is basically a flooded river. They put a dam on it and raised that river up 50 feet, and that's what created all the um, little pockets and stuff like that. And what I refer to as channel is actually the old right river here. channel. It's going to be the deepest section of the lake. Yeah, You can see, um, let's look at this lake. All right, the main channel looks like it's about 56, 57 feet. Um, this, like, 30 feet you're seeing along here, that used to be land. Um, Before they flooded and yeah, backed it all up. That's the old shoreline. So everything here never used to exist. This is all You'll find cities new sometimes. Stuff. Oh, yeah. These there's houses. There's ponds. There's and, all kinds of stuff. And same with the secondary the channels, channel. too. They're just smaller yeah, creek channels. There's, that flew, they're creeks in. that dumped into the river before they flooded it. So th this is the deepest section of the reservoir. It's the, the main river channel. This is the only place where there used to be water before they put a dam on it. That's what I'm referring to. And then, uh, like I said, you got to create, this is like kind of a bad example because it's just a pocket. But that little gut you see running yeah, into this channel. pocket would be a creek channel, you know. Absolutely. Here's one right here. This creek channel's coming yeah. in right here, and it's bumping the bank. That's when we mean when it swings. That would be a swing. When it swings back right if we zoom yeah. out right here, this is a big channel swing, swings, and then cuts back over to the other sides. Channel swings. We'll leave this map up because we might need to get back yeah. to her. Um, channel swing. In natural lakes in the south, do bass have large migration? Oh, no. Or, yeah, <laughs> I totally read it and said the opposite. Uh, in natural lakes in the north, do bass have large migration movements, or is it more of a smaller movement, home range type movement? Yeah, I don't think, I don't even know if those bass down south make a, as big I don't a, think anything does. You know, they're all going to, you know, let's say, let's just take this creek as an example, you know. That fish is going to live somewhere along this main river channel in the summer. He's going to use this ditch to migrate back to where he spawns. He's going to spawn, you know, somewhere back in here, use that ditch, run out to eventually make his way back home here in the summer or winter or whatever you want to call it. Um, and let's give up. But in natural lakes, I don't, I don't think, uh, you know, you know, they might go into shallower bays and then slide out to, you know, more of the main lake basin. Um, but, uh, and, and 
there's just so many variables. You know, a largemouth, there's some places up north, a largemouth will sit underneath the same lay down for the entire open water season, you know. And there's places where, you know, small mouse might move 30 miles in the course of a year, you know, chasing, uh, depends on the forage they're on, you know. Typically, crawfish eaters and bluegill eaters move the least. And, uh, you know, like shad, tulipy, whitefish. They're um, movers. The shad moves. The, the, their forage is moving, you know. A, a crawdad, I mean, how far does he got moving a year? Like, I like it. That was great. And bluegill, 30 yards, same thing. They you know what the I mean? Same. They, 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 He's not they, going that far. They ration their bluegills in their little cuts. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I got eight bluegills under this dock, and I'm going to eat them all eventually. Yeah. Um, so, but it depends on the forage around. If they're, you know, if the forage is a shad or tulipy or something like that, that's always moving, sort of the fish. And a good one, that's, if I could, a, another Navionics webinar that I've watched in the past. That was a really good one. Paul Mickley, the national sales manager, and Brandon Palinick. I uh, did one on the triangle effect. And that it's actually, a, it's more, the whole webinar is actually about that question right there. So you can find it on YouTube if you want more information on that. It, it was highly, enter, it, it, I learned a lot off of that deal. You guys ever fish Lake Anna or Smith Mountain Lake? I haven't been to either one of them. They're man made lakes in Virginia. Been there? I haven't been to either one. I, I heard, the, heard the they're Smith nice. Mountains, uh, Anna, Lake Anna in Virginia? Yeah. yeah. I fished it. Yeah, what about yeah. it? Why don't you tell us, Pete? Pete, Pete tells us he's fished it. it it's, uh, it's a uh, blueback uh, lake, isn't it? A full, a I know Smith stretch, Mountain is. Big stretches. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it had a lot of shad in it. Really? Yeah. No, Lots it's of shad. shad. A lot of shad. Yeah. No. <laughs> thanks, <laughs> thanks, Pete. <laughs> thanks, Pete. <laughs> Uh, you about? No, yeah. yeah, what do you want? We don't know. We, Pete's fished it. None of us have. Uh, Somebody wants to see Ray's Town Lake, PA, broken down. I don't know where that is. If I could find it, I would. we would look at it. Take a look north to Ontario to Simcoe Fall Smallies. I can do that. I don't know where Simcoe's at. That's a bucket lister for me. I must love the small moth. Oh, maybe I don't. Is it this one? I think that's him. I don't know. Sure is. It was. Okay. This is Lake give Simcoe the, for fall. Give them the fall Small bite. Mouse. The fall bite, okay. bud. Yeah. I want to go this back. This lake kicks them out. I'm probably going to embarrass <laughs> myself because they're rasping this cushion's fish just a ton. Um, let's see how deep we're looking. I hope this guy's going to call you out on this. I hope, Probably. I hope this is a loaded question. Where's the Yes, whatever. That's Can deep. This? That's deep. No, just go with this. How do we get numbers? It ain't there. Okay. I'd probably under not a chart. All right. Well, I'd approach it like this. This, I like that, this what? Oh yeah. This awesome. whited out area. That's your main lake basin. I'm assuming there's tulabies in here because we're in Canada yeah. and it's a northern fish. Um, late fall, there's a tulabi spawn that goes on. This is a really key bite. Um, things you want to look for. You need access to deep water in the fall, but the tulabi need to. They spawn at what I think it's 42 or 45 degrees. Um, they actually need to spawn up in. Only he would know that. Depending on the clarity of the water, you know, they're still going to need to get up on the 8, 10, 12, 15 feet, and they come up at night. Um, so, okay, we're, this is our main lake basin. This is where I'm going to focus most of my attention on. It's late fall. This is where these fish are going to winter. But they need to be close to um, shallower water to access the tulipy spawn. Right here, what do we got? Long shoal. Looks awesome to me. Um, we got a bit of shallow water, three, four, five, six, this, this little 14, 18 foot here, um, two of are going to spawn on this at night. Um, daytime, the bass are going to slide off. It's colder. This sharp break right along here around the top of this point or a uh, hump is something I'd really look at. And, uh, I mean, these, these deeper. deeper humps, I know they catch them really deep on Simcoe. I've, I've never actually fished there. Um. But I'd look for humps and points with uh, quick access to shallow to deep water. 
Let's look at this. This comes up to 12, 13. That's probably shallow enough for Super a tool to be to spawn so on. Um, zoom out, really good deep water access all along this. Um, I mean, all this stuff, this lake looks pretty fun to fish, actually. It does, it looks awesome. All these little points and humps and stuff right here with these sharp breaks around them, close to the main lake basin. This is where I concentrate all my efforts. Um, this one says it only comes up to 25. I don't know if it comes up shallower than that or not, but, uh, um, <laughs> let's catch him on that. Yeah, this, this is where I'd, um, you know, I probably want, and I, I'm sure the guys that fish Simcoe, they probably catch them and all this stuff up in here. But if I didn't know the lake any better, um, you know, this hump looks really awesome. Um, looks like we got oh, some structure in here. This yeah. little hump coming up to the main lake basin. Um, Let's see how deep this stuff is. I mean, there's still good deep water even up in the shallower spots. So that might not be something you want to overlook. Um, but you know, this is another awesome looking spot. We got a spot where our tool bee can spawn right up here, 10, 12 feet. Easy access to deep water. Um, those are the stuff I would look for. Um, just that, those quick depth changes, but uh close to high spots, close to deep water, you know. I'm not gonna come in here and mess around with this bay. You know, I'm not gonna mess around on this bear bank, stuff like this, you know. These, these high spots with deep water breaks on them, if, if that helps at all. I'm sure the people that actually fish them are oh, laughing boy. at me now, but that's oh, what I'd look at it first time ever being there in the fall. People are getting specific now. I know. I probably shouldn't answer that last question. No, we got to go into them all. Uh, let's do Grand Lake, Oklahoma for post spawn or summer. First, um, some, the yeah, Oklahoma, there's a something about Oklahoma being down south, good shallow water bite all year. And Grand Lake, Grand Lake all year. But um, you know those big points coming out of the spawning areas out towards the main channel. That's the stuff I'd look for. Um, Grand Lake, they love and those long shallow points like these ones in the summer they get on i know that um everything's yeah. so vertical grand so different because it's i mean you're talking 100 feet like right here off of the bank so anywhere you can actually find structure that that rolls out there uh again these are good long shallow structure here you got a big uh yeah, shot right with the, the river channel. channel coming in i mean and, and the road bed going through there um but again talking fall there a lot of those fish are gonna or we're talking no post spawn spawn yeah 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 so they're gonna come out onto these shallow points i think kvd one when they were there cranking those shallow points yeah, stuff like but that something about oklahoma if there's water in the bushes i guarantee there's fish they in like the bushes it. year round on that lake choice um, of polarized glasses amphibias all the way yeah. best lens is most comfortable frame to wear i, I forget mean, they're there literally there, there's a lot of good glass companies out there but uh I, i've tried almost every pair of sunglasses there is amphibians are the lightest most comfortable ones to wear they all feel nice if you wear them for an hour or two a day that's great but if you're gonna if you're gonna be a man and do if you got the time to do it and put on them 16 hour days every single day if you wear them heavy glasses the tops of your ears hurt your nose hurts um amphibians got awesome lens and they're most comfortable ones i've ever used Summer pattern for Texas rivers with no grass. That's true. Reservoir. Texas and, and uh, Amistad is out of grass. Uh, I, I have fished Amistad before, uh, but it was winter time oh, yeah. that we fished, fished there. Andy fished there, won there. <laughs> Congratulations. Yeah. I'd look for deep process. structure points, humps, yeah. uh, old ponds. What were you fishing, Andy? House, Long house. extended points coming out into the river channel, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Long, long extended river channel. I mean, again, Sometimes that winter summer stuff can get kind of similar. Yeah, Same day, really feed, similar. feeding stations that they can move up vertical and get on. Um, I, I hear Amistad's been a tough deal. It's been yeah. changing different. Everything's it's the lakes changing for better or for worse or whatever. The fish are a lot deeper, so um, yeah, I'd look for offshore structure yeah. points, humps, house foundations, plenty ponds, of it, plenty beds, of all of that, all there. bridges, whatever, whatever it might be. Uh, get into rivers a little bit. What would an area like pool seven, eight, nine of the Mississippi? Most of the river, I, I'm assuming they're talking about the Mississippi and most. Area. What would an area on pool seven, eight, nine 
in most of the rivers. Yeah. A tough question. Yeah, I'd really ask that. I, I can't tell you. Watts Bar, Tennessee. Never been there. I'm no. not sure what the question is. Uh, Northern Lakes. Will pre spawn and post spawn fish be in the same type of spots? The, the staging fish definitely will. Pre spawn's really kind of a tough. You can't really just call it pre-spawn because there's actually a few phases of that. Um, your staging fish, like your fish that are waiting to move up, pre-spawners and post-spawners will be on the same stuff. Um, and even like the shell stuff, I mean, you could be flipping laydowns and catch a pre-spawner one flip and the next tree catch a post-spawner. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're definitely going to use the same stuff. But I'd say like a, you know, a real like pre-spawn just about to spawn fish versus like a – I don't know, even, even post-spawn has a couple phases. I would say the earlier pre-spawn phases and the later post-spawn phases will line up as well as will the uh, yeah, yeah, later yeah. pre-spawn and the earlier post-spawn phases will kind of will kind of line up as well. That's a great way to put it. Um, How do you track bass on rivers? Pool 8, Mississippi. Um, basically, it currents everything on the Mississippi River. When they're spawning, they don't want none of it. And the rest of the year, they the large mouse want a little bit and the small mouse want a lot of it. Um, this is my best advice I can give for you. Uh, Rob, you're the man, dude. Yeah, you, what's you're up, Rob? Rob? We like, man, you're awesome. He says, hey, guys, sorry I'm late. Might have to duck out when the doctor comes back in the room. Right on, dude. You the just, doctor can watch, you, too. Yeah, get, hopefully they're fish. I like it. Uh, lakes that aren't mapped do you use google earth to break them down lots of small lakes around here that aren't mapped how do you approach a, an unmapped lake of course yeah google earth is great visual looking yeah provided you have clear water yeah if you can if see you, if you get if to you a mud hole google earth on. don't do you much good other than what's on the bank but if you get to crystal clear water you can see every hump and point in that grass bed in that lake so I mean, you should probably start shallow <laughs> if you're showing up to a lake that doesn't get familiar with what's going on and start you know, get familiar with how something, move it out. But one thing too, I should bring up, um, man, making maps now is super easy. You can do it yeah. on the fly. Make, Max make yourself a map. live, or or just anybody can tr contribute to sonar charts, and that map become available. You don't have to yeah. buy that. Uh, there's other options out there. I mean, just really get into, yeah. you know, the if 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 it's a lake you go to a, a lot, don't accept the fact that there's not a map because in today's day and age, where everything's about money and doing stuff quick. The odds of a chart company coming out there and, and paying big m money yeah. for a chart crew to come to a thousand acre lake probably not going to happen, you know. Or, yeah. but you can go out there and you can make it while you're fishing. I mean, yeah. there's tons and of options there. Depending yeah. on how small a lake you're talking, about. if you're talking 103 acres, you could have a map of that lake in 20 no, minutes. I do it. I do. I use 20 Mandiana minutes. You could have a flawless lake map. When I was practicing for Erie last year, those those reefs aren't perfect. You know, they go over them. They're so hard that, that they, they go over them. And, and there's little tiny intricacies that I want. And it's those small spots that those big five-pounders will want to set up. In. And I'd make a map live while I was fishing it one day, and I'd have that accessible to me. I knew where the sweet spots was. My competition didn't always if, if they didn't have that. So they're making it extremely easy to, to be able to make maps. Uh, definitely utilize one of those tools if it's a map you're going to fish a lot. Uh, when you guys talk, Brian's asking, when you guys talk about doing your research, oh, I just lost it, just jump. Uh, when you guys are talking about doing your research, like what it takes to win or hot baits for certain lakes, where do you find that info? Uh, all on the internet, you can Google most stuff, look at old tournament results to give you most of your wins. Um, look for common denominators, too. Don't take it for a grain of salt. Fishermen are fishermen still. You know, you want to make sure you're getting good data. Look for – I like to look back. I don't do so much as far as here. I like to look back at everything and find those common denominators, certain things that they say, hydrilla or – Certain creek. Certain creek that maybe is just – keeps coming up for the over the last yeah. decade you might want to check there i mean yeah. you know people know when they go to kentucky lake paris and south you can get into you're good you have that or you have more grass once you hit paris and south there's just different things going Thanks. on depending on what you're looking for so uh scouring the internet forums anything anything you can do to try to find information um it is awesome and and now with everybody doing how-to videos and, and that stuff so much easier you can kind of get some good info by some guy you know somebody's out there showing you how to throw a football jig and it just so happens to be the lake that you want in july and you're like hmm, 
you can, you can put some stuff out there. Uh, what baits do you use to locate populations of bass during the spring, late summer on northern lakes? Once you've located them, what techniques do you use to close in on bigger fish? Spring and late summer, it's uh, it's kind of a drastic. It's a bit, yeah, it's uh, change there. yeah, so much. Uh, I depend. I guess it depends too on largemouth and smallmouth. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know about bay. Pretty I mean, it's broad. A, it's pretty question. broad. We're trying to keep it to maps for just this one. Glass. Um, if there anything typically specific? is, you know, if you're really like trying to find them, the faster you can fish, the better. You know, Swim jig, either jig moving one. baits, you know, a crankbait, a DT crank bait. series, a jerk bait if you're fishing smallmouths, top waters, whatever. Top water can be sneaky good post spawn too. Oh you yeah, know? Top, I mean, it, post spawn especially awesome with better a frog. A frog's a good frog, one. Frog shallow bass, water. Bass, Absolutely. Food, you know. Uh, Josh, are you using the new know, 2D yeah. structure? If so, what are your thoughts? Um, it's actually a 3D structure scan and I am. We talked about that a little bit. It's, uh, it's awesome for sure. What baits do you like to fish deep or ledge fishing? I'm trying to learn more to fish deep. Been a bank buster my whole life. Uh, a big plug, big DT16, DT20. That's a great way to love fish. Then a big uh, outcast football, football jig. Drag that thing around. You can Carol, feel everything. You Andy, know? Carol Arrow. Carolina rig, always been a staple. Drop yeah. shot if you're fishing for smallies or even yeah. largemouth. I mean, no matter Drop, what. That's a good bait to once catch you fish on. But Not a big crankbait or a big football jig, you can feel everything down there. It might be all muck, and then boom, you come over some shell, or boom, you hit some rocks or something. Uh, something that's really – telegraphing back to you what's down on the bottom where you're casting is something i prefer to start out with um and, and but yeah drop shot worm whatever i mean you, you can catch some fish yeah, on big anything Texas rig worm, that's honestly great the most rods you, the more different bait if you get on a school the more different type stuff you can have on the better you know you can throw a worm in there and catch 10 in a row and then you don't get a bite for five casts and you pick up a jig and catch one on the first cast or with anything else, just keep switching it up once you're on, on the school. And and honestly, I got to tell you, one of my uh, – turning into a confidence bait, especially in practice when I'm looking for them as a big swim bait, uh, they show you so much stuff. You might not be able to feel stuff like what Seth was saying as far as bottom contour and all that, but a big swim bait shows you big fish. Even if you don't even catch it, big fish follow big swim baits. And they they'll just show themselves to you in practice. And – Honestly, a, a seven, eight pounder following my swim bait to the boat, it, it tells me a whole lot about where I'm going to be fishing and what I'm going to be doing. Even if I might turn to then a drop shot to catch that fish, I don't yeah. care. That big swim bait will show me that fish. Uh, Rob, good question. Do you normally find yourself using map apps and maps, or do you just use paper, ma or do you use paper maps more? Uh, I definitely use my Navionics map by far the most. The paper map I use, yeah. one, it's just old school, and I like that, and just have a map. Like I said, it's a big and, picture. That's something yeah. I'm going to look at in the morning, you know. Um, I'm going to look at it right before I go out, get an idea of what's going on. Then, you know, after you've been fishing for a day, you got a little better idea of what's going on. I'm going to look at that paper map again and kind of get more dialed into big areas, what section of the river or, or reservoir I want to fish, more so than um, specific spots are going to come off of my uh, – uh, Navionics chip. Uh, how much time do you invest on map studying prior to going to a new lake? I'm uh, still fighting this one a bunch, trying to it figure depends out on the lake. lake you know. If you're on a reservoir, it's pretty basic. But sometimes when we go to those uh, uh, river systems, you know, Sabine type river, Winya Bay type place, um, I mean, I don't know, like you don't even like two weeks. Like it's pathetic. Steven says, thank you. Good information. We appreciate the love, man. Please keep getting on. Uh, uh, JD, I actually just did electronics training for him. He's an awesome dude. I'm going to talk about O'Dowd. There's an attorney there this Sunday. I'm going to guess you'll probably be doing some bed fishing, some post-pond fishing. That's uh, kind of fun. Yeah. Is it, yeah, room yeah, in that derby? Uh, I'll be gone at the Arkansas River. I'm all. Fighter, he just lives down the street. Not I'm too looking far. for that Daiwa Rapala boat out there. Uh, Parker Ryan asked, what do you throw in the lake is some is submerged trees, not just standing timbers or trunk, but branchy trees submerged in 15 foot of water. Um, lakes that have a lot of timber, um, 
I kind of ignore it, to be honest with you. I mean, the fish are still going to relate to the structure more than the timber. Oh, you're still going to want to fish your points, your humps, um, river channel ledges and stuff like that. And uh, the timber kind of just becomes a void point. But lakes where it is good, um, spotted bass will relate to it a lot in standing timber. And there's some lakes a largemouth get in it too. Um, I'm, I, I don't fish it a ton. I've seen guys do good on like, swim baits around if you got clear water around the stand and timber or uh you can throw a drop shot in there and catch fish out of it as well chuck boso is a, a friend of mine he was my co-angler actually for a weekend through my first out-of-state tournament at oklahoma asked any suggestions for the arkansas river got a central open i do too but i still got a re- i had a suggestion for you for that tournament and then be drop shot and a frog right in the middle of that channel Seems to be pretty good on the Arkansas River that time of year. Wow. <laughs> good work. Good work, man. Uh, where'd I go, bro? Uh, what about – Rob asks, what about western reservoirs in Colorado? Not many arms. Should you focus on riprap dams since we have very little vegetation? I mean, yeah, obviously. I mean, if you don't have a lot of vegetation and you don't have a lot of arms, uh, any my dad lives in Colorado. Anything I've ever looked at for Colorado, it seems just like, you know, so bank fishing is still big, but you might be a little further off the bank. You, a lot of times when I look at those type a little bit, look at like some of your Highland Reservoir stuff, you could have transition changes in the, in the bank. That ch- shade's a big one. Shade lines. Um, are big but there. if you don't have much for contour, you don't have much for creek arms, and you don't have any vegetation, you're looking at the bank, you're chasing yeah. bait, stuff like I, I that. Don't, I don't know what you mean by Western Reservoir. I'm maybe we don't, we like don't bluffy, a deserty thing. Yeah. I know yeah, the, yeah, the shade line's a big deal. I don't, I don't know a ton about that. I'm sorry. I just... I fished Havasu once, but it, it laid out kind of more like a yeah typical reservoir. It's pretty fun. When should I start throwing poppers on Mille Lacs? Pretty soon. Yeah, I mean, getting there. yeah. Even you can, you can, if the water's warm enough, you can still catch some pre-spawn fish on it. But after they spawn and once the mayflies start hatching, that popper gets pretty good. It gets real strong. Uh, what is your bread and butter bait fishing? Fish bread and butter or bread and butter bed fishing bait. Damn, that's almost a tongue twister. Or baits. Uh, mine's a, I, I really like the Biovex Colt Tail. It's IU color. It glows back at me. I can see it. As a matter of fact, I got a video coming out in a week. Underwater footage, everything. It's awesome. Yeah. That, that's mine. I, I like baits I can see. More, more often, than, it depends. If I saw, let's say it's in practice the day before the tournament, and I go by a bed and I see a nice one on a bed. I can make, I'm just going to mark that fish. I'm probably going to wing a Senko or something from super far away. The next day, that fish is never going to know I'm there. I'll probably catch that fish. Outside of that, if I'm watching the fish, I like white. I like baits that I can somewhat see just because a lot of the times I have to pester that fish into biting. And, I just, and I'm getting a reaction strike. And, and I just need to know when the fish bit it. And then, then I can get them. Um, What's your favorite? Anything in particular? Uh, I like a Daiwa rattling tube hogs for my a favorite. I'll fish it on a Texas rig. That rattle's huge. That, yeah. I like that hog farmer makes that uh, yeah. hog nut rattle. I like Man, that put a couple extra of those on yep. mine too. Absolutely. Any kind of – they like anything that's going to annoy that fish. Yeah. And just – you want – like we were looking at the underwater footage of it. There's so many bluegill and all that stuff around that you want something that just is so annoying to that fish that it's in there. They're not eating it because – they're hungry. Yeah. They're not eating for that reason. So, you know, you just got to get that fish to bite. How do you decide when to use shaky head versus light Texas rig? What does type of cover dictate this? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Everything kind of, yeah. Texas rig, probably just in the grass, any kind of hard cover, rock or wood, I'd use a shaky head. Uh, Michael says, I'll be gone the whole month of June for military training. First of all, thank you for your service. Yeah, That's awesome, man. Uh, I'll be back in July. From your guys' experience on Mille Lacs, how would I go about targeting smallies, go-to baits? Uh, we talked about that quite a bit in the, in the webinar, actually, for um, summertime fishing. You know, you want to get out, get on some of them humps, move around yeah. some of those brake lines. Um, that those fish can move up vertical on those slick, calm days, get right up on top of that thing and 
Yeah. Put your amphibias back on and go out there and go find them. You yeah. Know, Top fun. water's good. Tube's good. Little hair jig's good. Uh, Rashi Top Walker. That's an awesome uh, walking bait. I, I like to throw that a lot in the summer. We're going on two hours. Should we keep going? Well, let's bang them out. We're, we're almost, get a little we're almost quicker there. The questions. Um, love to learn more about how to use my hydro wave in regards to best selection volume. That's we get a lot of those. I don't know if we have easy. enough to get a whole webinar, but let's do that. Let's add that yeah, in to one. Yeah, not enough for a whole webinar. Basically, uh, sound selection is kind of up to you. There's only a few signs I really run, power pattern being the number one. Um, but volume is something that I, uh, I play around with a lot. Um, basically, the... The noisier it is where you're fishing, the louder you want it. You know, if it's blowing, you got waves, you got boats running around, stuff like that. There's a lot more noise in the water, so I crank it up. And also, the the distance I am from the fish that I'm trying to catch, I dictate a lot too. You know, if I'm fishing out deeper, I'm gonna make a long cast. I got the thing cranked up. If I'm on the bank making twenty foot flips to lay downs, I'm gonna turn it down about half volume. And uh, those are the two determining factors I use for uh, um, volume would be uh, distance I'm trying to catch a fish and the noise a little the same way as if it's slick calm or in a boat on the lake there's not much noise I'm gonna have that thing turned down pretty quiet uh, how would you approach a lake that doesn't have islands or creek channels and gets deep real fast close to shore uh, a lake like Geneva Wisconsin I, I haven't been to Geneva a lot of times if you, if you don't have structure no you know and it gets deep quick, you're, it's still a lot of bank fishing um, to be had. It just all depends. I mean, I guess. Well, you might still be fishing that break. I mean, you you're just going to. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. in Wisconsin. Oh. I don't know if we got time to go and all this. There you go. Um, I, I would just look for irregularities in that. Even if, it, even if it's a deep bank all the way around the lake, some areas it's going to be not as deep, and some areas it's going to be deeper. That's what I'm bagging. I don't know where it is. We're going to We're gonna scratch that. All right. uh, do you have any tips on Texas lakes? Oh, God, we got Fish for beggins. Um, it's Texas, man. <laughs> just to clarify from y'all's discussion with river channels and bluff, where we go? And bluff walls, y'all suggest the outer channel swing. Um, I'd, I'd run pattern on it. I mean, typically the outer swing bluff banks are going to be good. Deeper. But, you know, some places the shallow one might be good. That's where your clay points a lot yeah. of times come on that shallow side. Fish a couple of them and whatever's going, just run pattern. Which Navionics card is the best to get? I, I like the Navionics Plus card personally, we but travel I, I travel a around yeah. a lot. I, I can go on in 20 minutes, download every single lake that I'm going to for that year, have them all on my graph. And, uh, but you know, if you stay in one place, maybe a regional chip might be better for you. But either way, I like I like the fresher data that I get out of the Navionics Plus card. Man, a lot of specific lakes to go through. Sorry, guys, we just don't have the time to break down each specific lake. If you want to send us an email with some questions, man, we'll happily get on those. And uh, uh, that's a good question. Uh, Corey McIntyre, what do you look for on river maps to track spawning habitats? You talked about uh, uh, for large mouse backwaters, just try to get out of the current. Uh, not all backwaters are created equal. You know, maybe one out of ten will be good or one out of five will be good. But um, they're, de they're definitely going to get out of the main river to spawn. I mean, some fish will still spawn on the main river, you know, behind a big tree or, like, somewhere out of the current. But, you know, that might be one fish on a bed and not. 50 of them, you know. And a lot of thank yous, guys, for the tail end of these questions. No, thank you guys for coming on. Uh, hopefully some of you guys won some prizes, and if not, we'll win them on some ones coming up. We really appreciate it. You guys keep tuning in. We'll keep giving them to you. That's that's how it goes, for sure. You got another Army guy. Dave. Dave Black, thanks for your service. From Fort Knox. Thanks, man. We appreciate Starting that. all that Big gold time. over there. Yes, sir. Listening from... Seth, please describe the different stages of the post spawn you mentioned earlier. Um, just uh, I don't know if there's exact stages you can put them into, but you know, a fish is going to spawn, and then for a female, it might it might hang around for a day or two and then move out deep. Males will be a little different. There'd be fry garters. That's something you want to look for. Um, the male bass, and I've seen females do it. They'll actually guard the fry, um, frog. Terminator frogs probably the best way to catch them. 
Um, but then they're just gradually going to make their way out and eventually become summertime fish. Uh, so hard to listen to you guys and watch the Raptors at the same time. Nice. We're competing with NBA playoff basketball. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. I'd listen to us too. Yeah, come on. Um, like JD, oh, imagine about. that. That he wants to take you oh, up on that adult. He wanted to take you up on that adult tournament offer. <laughs> Hit Sunday? him up sometime. He's got somebody, but he wants to go. Hit him up sometime. I'll Rob, thanks for the Michael. Thank you, thank you. I'm in for a Hydra Wave video. We should do that. Yeah, do I don't know if we can talk about Hydra Wave for an hour. Well, but we can give him a video. We can do that. We can do something good. Really appreciate you. always good info. Chuck Bosa, small world back. Oh, oh, hold on. Chad Eddings, really appreciate you guys. Always good info. Funny JD mentioned Chuck Bozo, small world back in Oklahoma. I fished the Sooner Bassmaster Club with him. Really good guy. That's cool, man. I didn't. Small world. Chad's here in Minnesota. Yeah. What would be your top three baits for fishing points during post spawn? What order would you fish them? I don't know if we're talking north or south, yeah. but uh, I mean, if you're fishing hard bottom outside, crankbait, outcast football jig, um, and then probably a drop shot just to pick off the rest of your fish. But Carolina rig's good, big worm's good, spoon, hair jig. I mean, there's a million varieties. But if, if you're going to keep it simple, a big plug and a big worm, and just get after it. Last question we're going to take. Or did we announce surprise winners? Uh, Mick? We did not. We will announce them at our next webinar, uh, but we'll probably be in touch with most of the winners before then, too. Uh, um, we try to, at least for the grand prizes, the other ones we'll, we'll, we'll let everyone know at the next webinar. So, again, that's our yeah. way of making sure we all stay tuned. Thanks for the questions. Awesome too questions. Many to man. Answer. We literally had to skip a few of them in specific ones. Again, if you've really got some hardcore specific questions to your lake, send us an email. And we'll uh, we'll do our best to try to break her down and give you give you some advice on it, uh, guys. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, Probably guys. As good as you guys. Thank See you. It. We appreciate it. Have a good one.